Thank you very much for joining us and for staying with us here on TV3 and 3FM. You can also catch us on DSTV279 and at 3news.com. Now, today we're talking about the GMPC Acre deal. We'll be looking at all the issues, the nuances, and bring to light the key issues in the debate. And this has been going on for quite a while, almost a month. But um, we can now take a deep dive into it. Now, this deal came about because of a request made by the Ministry of Energy to Parliament for GMPC to acquire stake in the deep water uh, tunnel Cape Three Points and the South Deep Water Tunnel for some $1.6 billion. And this is from Acre Energy and AGM separately because there are two fields. You talk about the Pecan field, which is the Acre Energy field, and then you can also refer to the Nyankom field, which is the AGM field. And this has debated, led to a fierce debate, lots of controversy about the spirit and the intention behind uh, this deal. So civil society has waded into it and has been very strong in opposition to this. But there have been others who support the deal for a number of reasons, and we'll get into that. So this morning, that's what we'll be dealing with. And so I welcome in studio uh, Ben Boachi, Executive Director of ASAP. Ben, good morning. Great. Nice to see you. Thank you. And also via Zoom, we welcome Dr. Yusuf Suleimana, who is also an energy analyst. Thank you, Dr. Suleimana, for joining us. Good morning. All right. Thank you. So let's talk a bit about this deal. I'll start off with uh, Ben. So there's been a lot of criticism about borrowing some 1.6 billion for this deal. And the view is that it's to buy a 37% stake in the Peckham field and a 70% stake in the Nyankom field. First, is this price exaggerated for the two fields? Uh, thank you very much once again, Jifa, for, for uh, having me here. And um, I think, I mean, civil society has been frontal with our uh, understanding of the transaction as is. And like you did indicate, we haven't had, you know, enough response uh, from GNPC until recently where we saw the um, uh, chief executive mount some media platforms to try and you know do some damage control if you like and from what we are seeing him do we are seeing um, a deliberate smear campaign against civil society who have criticized the transaction with specific details and he's evading that and focusing on some tangential issues that are not so important uh, to the conversation his claim that I mean, if we acknowledge he's available to engage, it's not accurate. He's never been available. The corporation has never been available. And I'm sure you would have tried. I have tried. To I get must GMPC admit. to the studio. Yes. They have never been available uh, to engage. The ones that they tried to engage, uh, we punched into the analysis and we asked for a conversation with the corporation itself when they brought in the uh, Lambert people to engage us. And since then, we are still waiting. Uh, for that engagement. So the public outlook that GMPC has been available and civil society doesn't want to engage and we just want to criticize the corporation is inaccurate. They have not uh, been available. Um, we issued a statement cataloging issues with the transaction. And ordinarily you would want to see the corporation respond to us. You know what they did? They rather responded to the Norwegian Embassy, to Parliament and to the IMF because we copied them. All right. So where is the engagement from their end? There hasn't been any engagement. And we also see another diversionary act of Mr. Kekes, Dr. Keke Sapon, you know, trying to rather tout his credentials to win public support uh, for this transaction. Uh, you know, talking about his role in Cocoa Board and how he helped syndicate loans, which has become a practice uh, today. I'm not sure we want to celebrate that as civil society. If he wants to draw our attention, to his public life. We are happy to engage in that, but we have deliberately stayed on this conversation to ensure that we are dealing with the specifics and the subject matter. And that smear campaign, we will not engage in. I mean, he can invite us into that conversation. I'm not sure civil society will want to celebrate turning Cocoa Board into 
a debt procurement institution uh, for several decades. Recently, I was in the U.S. to learn about how cocoa is processed, all right, in a museum. And they had cocoa growing in the room to show people how cocoa thrives. That is the legacy you want to leave and not becoming a debt procurement enterprise. And I'm surprised that he leaves out other roles in public life, like being in tour. We are happy to get into all of those things, all right? And as much as possible, we want to stay with this conversation. And if he wants to stay there, we will dissect the issues, we will bring to perspective what the problems are with this particular transaction. We can even zoom deeper into his role in this GMPC and pick on many, many, many issues. But as civil society, we believe in the carrot and stick approach where we encourage the corporation and try to encourage them to do what is right. And that is why we are not always frontal you know, on some of the ills in, in the corporation. Okay, but and, let, and rather, I want to focus on okay. this. But let's focus, right. let's focus on this um, in terms of why this deal isn't the best deal at this time. And that's why I asked for the valuation of these blocks based on the offer. Is it exaggerated? I think that is the conclusion that we have come to. And I tell you what, you know, this is a, a transaction that has significant history. The blocks, they have a significant history to it. Um, the Hess block, um, which is the Deepwater Tunnel Cape 3 point, was um, managed by Hess uh, from 2006, all right, until 2014 when they decided to offload shares. Uh, and even before that, they had made discoveries. They had done 12 wells, um, seven discoveries, and five appraisal wells. And they decided to offload 50% of that um, to uh, government and to look oil and fuel trade. And we refused to buy our 10% that was allotted to us. So fuel trade and um, uh, 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 look oil bought their shares. Subsequent to that, they decided to leave and exit and sell the 50% rem remainder to Ake mm -hmm. at a cost of $100 million. So that is how much Ake paid for the stake in that block. And we do agree that subsequently that Ake has done some work. They have done three wells uh, subsequently to further appraise the well to be sure of what um, has left them. And, you know, we are now being told that that three wells, all right, is costing us in excess of $500 million. And we are asking question, how? What I do know, though, Mr. Bwachi, is that to drill one well, it costs almost $100 million. So if they've drilled, drilled three, you, you are talking about $300 million, in addition to all other works that do come up. It is expensive, really, the oil and gas sector. Talo alone over the last 12 years has spent, what, almost uh, more than $10 billion on Jubilee, more than $8 billion on 10. And we, that's an average of a billion a year. We can come into those specifics. I mean, every well has its own challenges and its own peculiarities. And the average in Ghana is about $40 million per well, right? The, the, the most difficult well that we have seen uh, on the OCTP well, which cost about $100 million, was even eventually, I think, abandoned. Mm -hmm. So it's not every well that costs that much. This is just an exploratory well. Yes. It hasn't even been appraised, mm -hmm. all right? Um, so... Uh, we can get to those specific, but we are asking the questions for answers. And so you, so you the fundamental question so you, even is this. Just a quick one. So you criticize Acre's projection yeah. that they've spent close to $800 million on the work done in that field. The work done. And the, the numbers keep shifting. I mean, I'm hearing from Dr. Keke upon in recent conversation about how they spent the money and what their audit reviews. And they're even telling you that when they bought the blocks, the two blocks for about 150 million, um, their paperwork even cost around 30 million dollars. <laughs> All right, and those are numbers that we have to interrogate. Those are numbers we have to question. How does registration and paperwork cost that much money? We have to interrogate that. How does ACES operational cost beyond uh, uh, administrative cost? You know, exceed $200 million from the audit that GMPC says he has done. 
We have to analyze that. For two years in Ghana, you can spend over 200 million on administrative costs. We have to interrogate that. Because it's not a full-fledged business where you're even producing, you have all the uh, uh, staff in place, you are building your own structures, you are renting. What is costing us 200? We want to interrogate those numbers mm -hmm. to be sure that the Ghanaian people are actually paying uh, for, uh, 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 for something you know, within the range of what the market would have offered. Would you, uh, uh, for it. What would for you be a more realistic figure if, you know, GMPC is to go into this deal uh, knowing fully well that there's something to, to be gained? What's a realistic figure? Now, you see, that is why we're saying that the market should determine the price. It's when, when you say the market, you mean there should be a bid? or There should be a bid. And that is what Ake went to the market and got nobody to buy it. The market should determine it. Let the market... And interestingly, GMPC has the, the right of first refusal, first right of refusal. So if nobody wants it, or even somebody puts up the bid, GMPC can say, I can match the bid mm -hmm. and pick it. So why are you acting as the, the desperate one to okay. pay for any amount let that uh, uh, AK is asking of mm -hmm. you at this point? Okay, so let me ask essentially about the separate, stake, the separate blocks because... Most people may be thinking of it as one block, but it's two. There's the Pecan field, which Eka had been working on for quite a while until the depressed oil market environment hit, where we saw oil prices really drop significantly. And then, of course, COVID worsened that. We are seeking to procure 37% of that. And then the Nyankom ex exploratory field, that's we're seeking to procure 70%. I'm just wondering, if there's been some significant work done on Pekan, mm. isn't it worth our while um, to borrow for that development program? But Nyankom is exploratory. We are now going to see if we'll find something. We are, we are not exactly sure if the, the reserves are, are verified, are quantified. Would you prefer that, or would civil society prefer that we invested in a field that already has verified, uh, quantifiable resources? No, I think you're spot on, and that is one of the questions we are raising, that you have two different uh, blocks with different stages right, of development or exploration. Uh, the Nyankum discovery on the AGM block is just one discovery. Mm -hmm. So the campaign that AGM had, they drilled two wells. One was a dry well, and one was a discovery. And now... The AGM is saying that that one well discovery that hasn't been appraised with initial estimates that they claim to be around 127 million, they want to sell that well to Ghana and values it at 700 million dollars. How do you come by that when you haven't done the necessary work to be able to estimate whether indeed that uh, uh, discovery can move into production? Because in, in assessing these resources, you are not only interested in how much you can estimate, but based on the geology and the rocks, how much can actually be extracted from the grounds. And that demands much more work for you to be able to come to that assessment. So how does GMPC sit down for somebody to value one discovery at $700 million you know, to influence the conversation on how much you want to pay for, for that well? where you can clearly see that Ake has defaulted on his plan of work. Ake has defaulted on his plan of work, yes, but we all know the, the circumstances that led to that. We all know those circumstances. Which is COVID, right? It's not just COVID. It was the depressed oil market environment, which had been going bad since 2018. No, but you have a contract with Ghana, right? The contract has prescriptions. So you want, we, them, you want them to borrow to do the development. Yeah. Is, that what, is that what offends you? That, that to the extent that they made a promise, they are not willing to borrow on their balance sheet to get the development done? No, so we are talking about uh, uh, AGM block now. Okay, so right? you, you are talking about the AGM when block. When you make a discovery, yeah. right, you are required within 180 days to do an appraisal. Right? So even if you have an excuse, that's 180 is about six months. Even if you have an excuse, maybe another six months. It's been two years. The world hasn't been appraised. There's no agency to appraise it. Okay. So why are we pampering them? And then now going to think about 
valuing at 700 million when they have refused to do the needful. You know, the contract is to be enforced. Okay. If the company cannot do the work that they promised to deliver, and if we have time to come back to the history of the mm -hmm. block, we get to understand the kind of incentive that we gave to Ake for them to be able to explore and do the necessary work on the block. If they are no longer interested in doing the necessary work, why are we being for the Christmas in this case? Okay, and uh, that's Ben Boachi there. He's the executive director of ASEP. So let's now turn our attention to Dr. Suleimana. Uh, Dr. Suleimana, I understand you support the deal, isn't it? If you can unmute Dr. Suleimana because I can't hear you, I beg your pardon. You? Good to see you. Yeah, so. Hello, Dr. Suleimana. Okay, looks like we are having some audio challenges with Dr. Suleimana. We'll try and correct that and come back to him. Yes, Dr. Suleimana? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, unfortunately, I can't hear Dr. Suleimana. We'll come back to him and um, we'll bring uh, his perspectives to you. It's still key points here on TV3 and 3FM. Thank you very much for joining us. And let's welcome to our studio as well, Dr. Thieu Achampong, economist and political risk strategist. Thank you very much for making some time for us and you're welcome. Good morning. Great. So we've been talking about the um, GMPC Acre deal and we've been trying to dissect and distinguish between the two fields uh, under uh, you know, discussion. But first, is the figure being put forward um, to procure these stakes exaggerated? Yes, uh, good morning once again to you and, and to your listeners. Um, I think I have had cause to run some of the numbers uh, myself I've spoken to at least about 20 or so professionals in the industry as well, both in Ghana and outside. And the broad conclusion is that the asset is overvalued or overpriced, and therefore the figure that is being bandied about um, does not really um, fit or align to what um, one should actually pay for if they were to go to the market for the, uh, for the asset. But I guess there are other substantive policy issues that we can discuss, but specifically on the question that you ask, certainly the, um, what is being purported as the transaction value or price or what they would negotiate on that basis, um, I don't think that the two assets are worth that price. What kind of figure would be a reasonable figure? So I have had or run some, we ran some numbers and I've been quoted on this. I think we're looking probably at half a billion um, as the net asset value, um, possibly, um, based on various assumptions going to this. But one of the key assumptions is actually the oil price. Um, and in some of the numbers that we're privy to, um, Ben would also be privy to, um, they're using about $67, $65 a barrel. And we've had cost to actually challenge those numbers uh, because if you look at some of the projections on the long-term trajectory of oil prices, certainly we would, should be valuing the asset between 55 and $60 a barrel. And $1 a barrel makes a big difference in terms of these valuations. So when you run that and you run other scenarios on the resource estimates, so how much oil can you actually produce from the two discoveries, because they're two separate things, and you know you make a, you know a few further assumptions, then you actually come to a substantially lower figure than um, what is being purported. I think one of the things people would like to know is that is it more about the fact that Acre AGM had put forward a plan of development and they've not implemented the plan of development and yet are expecting to make this kind of money from the government of Ghana. Is that what is offensive as opposed to actually getting them to make this investment? Um, I think it, it goes both ways because there are multiple stakeholders and people have different perspectives on it. I've spoken to people and some of the broad consensus is that um, Ake and its related sister company want to have their cake 
and eat it mm -hmm. or eat their cake and have it, however that goes. Um, but to the extent that Ghana went all out, literally, to get them to make these um, investments in the field only two years ago. Yes. Um, and then subsequently, pretty much uh, have turned themselves around and saying, okay, we want to sell the asset to you. Selling the asset is not the issue per se. It happens, people do m and deals in the industry across the board. The substantive issue really is, okay, at what price do you want to buy, for example, uh, the asset? The other substantive issue is, just in May of this year, Ake um, released various statements because the perception in the market was that they were going to sell out of Ghana. Mm -hmm. And there was a statement that came from the uh, Ghana office to the effect that they are committed long term to Ghana. And they are looking forward to resubmitting their revised plan of development by December of this year. This was just a few months ago. Only then, a few weeks or months down the line, for us to hear that they are seeking to divest some of their equity shares in the assets. So you begin to see some inconsistencies in the rhetoric and in the narrative. Um, and secondly, question then also then comes, well, if a company wants to divest, um, then should we be willing to invest in that, so I, I mean, should the national company be willing to invest in that, or you wait for them to submit the revised plan of development, let's see the new numbers, let's see the new revenue, um, the new production proje projections, let's see the development concept that they intend to use before you can actually make, there are so many uncertainties and unknowns around this particular proposed transaction at this time which then all fits into inflating the asset value. Mm. That really is, you know, it's really the substantive the issues that issue. we, we need to be uh, discussing, in my view. All and, right. and, and, and even if I may add, you see, as we speak, Ake has a vessel on site doing geotechnical and geophysical studies that informs whatever technology they anticipate to use for production. And they are telling us they have a, a, a break-even price of $30 even before those studies are concluded. How do they come by those numbers? And GMBC has bought into it, all right? And if Ake has, is saying that they've brought down the break-even price from $48 from the project finance perspective to $30, that makes the project even much more profitable. Why are they running away from the project? <laughs> all right, let's try Dr. Suleimana now and see if uh, the audio has been fixed. Dr. Suleimana, can you hear me? Okay, we still have technical challenges because I can really barely hear you. If you can just yeah, increase the volume on your on your Zoom. Yeah, I think this is maximum. Can you hear me, Diva? Okay, I think we'll have to try and fix that uh, from the production bench. Um, sorry about that, uh, Dr. Suleimana. Let me come back to um, you, um, Dr. Theo Champong. From a risk perspective, isn't it really just the case that Ghana is a difficult fiscal and production environment? Because Ghana, before the discovery of Jubilee, used to be called the graveyard of uh, petroleum companies. Jubilee de-risked the field uh, and the area. But the reality is that since Jubilee and even ENI, Sankofa Jinyami, we've not seen any real, you know, push. Hess was there for quite a while, but left. Yeah. And, and Exxon has also left. It just seems to me that there might be better prospects elsewhere. And we are talking about offshore Guyana and Suriname, where lots of discoveries have been made by Exxon and, of course, uh, by Hess together with Sinoc. So it really begs the question about the investment be made. It just means that our environment is more difficult and so the risk is higher and so the costs are more. Yeah, I don't think our environment necessarily is more difficult. Um, so I work in this industry. I talk to investors all the time. Um, and of course, countries are competing for the same petrodollar investments, right? Um, and it depends on the materiality of the resource base that you've got which also is a function of like your tax regime or fiscal regime, etc. But if you actually look at the prevailing tax regime in Ghana, 
It's actually in the middle of the park, so it's not necessarily like the most onerous or most difficult environment to actually do um, business in when it comes to um, oil and gas. I but think we but didn't the amendment of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act in 2015 make it more difficult no, for companies? It didn't, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So, okay, we increased the carried and participating interest mm -hmm. from hitherto to it's about 10 to 15 percent. Yes. Um, and then there were a few other minor adjustments um, here and there, but. Yeah, there, what? there were more fees being charged by the Petroleum Commission. Yes, the local content requirements the cumulative, became stronger. The cumulative package is what one or one metric you used to assess this is the government take, right? Which is like a benchmark across the board. And if you look at the government take in Ghana for a number of the oil fields, it's actually one of the lowest in the world. It's between 55 and 60 percent. Um, if you add the carried interest rate, it's about 67, 670 percent. The IMF has an estimate that says that what constitutes a decent or reasonable government take is between 60 and 85 percent. So we are just right in that ballpark figure. So I, I don't think that what we have in terms of the investment environment is necessarily disincentivizing to investors. What has happened is that there are other opportunities for investors, of course, elsewhere, like in Guyana, where has left here when the and they've got 10 times more the resource discovery mm -hmm. than you've got here in Ghana. And then now there's, you know, the bigger conversation about like energy transition, et cetera, et cetera. Fine. The question then becomes what should be the policy response of government or say the national oil company to this? Does that then in entail or mean that because people are living and, you know, people talk about quote and unquote stranded asset, we should necessarily be buying any asset that, that is on the market. What other strategic options are there? So in this particular case, we know, for example, that GMPC could possibly, if it's all about reserves and production that they want, there are a couple of other assets right here within the Ghana offshore jurisdiction that they could possibly buy, and which even are currently producing and has you know, relatively lower um, cost of production as well. So the, the argument really is not so much about the extenuating or external factors per se. As for me, it is to do with less interrogate the specific transaction that is on the table and its merit, and we can situate that within the bigger policy discourse. All right, and you're watching the key points here on TV3 and 3FM. It's also live on DSTV 279 and you can follow us online at 3news.com. We take a quick break and we'll be right back. You're welcome back to The Key Points. Feel free to send your questions to us on 055-698-789, uh, Let's now go back to our Zoom where we fixed uh, our audio challenges and welcome Dr. Suleimana. Thank you very much, sir, for your patience. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you and uh, good morning to your cherished viewers. Thank you. And, uh, you and uh, ben. ben. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So I understand that you support the deal, but before you tell us why, what do you make of the numbers put out suggesting that the valuation of these blocks uh, are overpriced? Yeah, if I, thank you very much. Um, I'll put on record that absolutely I have no uh, uh, problem with these valuations and stuff uh, going on. And I think that's an excellent thing to do uh, because if you quite remember, um, this deal had bipartisan support that quickly slipped through parliament. And so it is uh, agencies like CSOs to further delve deep into what is in the figures, what are the numbers. And I think Ben and uh, Tio, they, they delve so much into that. You know? And I think so, so for the numbers, I think they can continue to question that. In fact, at the end of the day, it will only give us value for money. And I, I, I absolutely, I don't have any problem with that. Yeah. But the fact that Parliament approved it as a bipartisan 
uh, decision doesn't make it you know, right or doesn't mean that we've gotten value for money. Shouldn't we have done that interrogation before uh, the approval? Yeah, that's correct. And that's why I think, uh, I mean, in future, I mean, involving, you know, we have to have broad-based involvement. I think what, what, I know, what, what, I, what I tend to notice is the fact that there's been some gaps. You know, you can hear Ben Baji saying, I mean, they try to reach GMPC, they are not getting that. And then at the end, at the, at the other, at, on the other hand, you know, Kiki Sapon is saying his doors are open. You know, so I, I, am, I, am, I, I want to look at it in, uh, in a different perspective. I, I, I'll be frank with you, Jifa. I'm an upstream player, you know, and I understand the business and I understand what goes on. So I just tell you why I think we need to sanitize the deal, but we shouldn't throw it, I mean, as it is. We should, you shouldn't throw it away. Now, number one, um, um, we have a, techn a, a technonic, a, 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 what we call a technonic movement, and that is real. Movement in the sense that we have <clears throat> upsurge in the world of renewables. Um, if, I, if you look at, if you just take yourself back some few months ago, I mean, we have three things that happened in the industry, and it was not serendipitous. It was all calculated and well planned. We had environmentalists winning the landmark case against Shell in Netherlands. We have ExxonMobil, you know, they were able to displace about two, two of their board of directors by climate change activists. And the third one was, you know, the release of IEA report, a damning report that sort of suggests that, I mean, if we have to achieve net zero by 2050, we have to stop investment into the world of hydrocarbon. That is a killer, I, I'll tell you of, as a player. If you stop investment into the world of hydrocarbon, that ends it. Now, <clears throat> where I will extend the discussion to the fact that now, if our case or our, our, our situation is a peculiar one, we have certain things we call ESG. Jifa, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Anyway, we have ESG, what we call environmental social governance. Now, this environmental social governance is get, getting a lot of momentum. You know, to the extent that, I mean, capital, get, get, going out to get capital from the capital market is becoming constrained and it's becoming so competitive. And so what it, mean is that what, it mean, what it will mean is that players now have to look inwards, like it or not. Where I work, I think we started with 20%. I can tell you that my cooperation is now having 60%. You have to start somewhere. So I don't support the idea that, okay, GMPs have been given a whole year, you know, I mean, I'm about a decade ago, they've been given money about $1 billion. They have not been able to drill a well. So should we not, I mean, should we leave it like that? That is for God's sake, that's our upstream. And with that, we don't have anything than that. And I can tell you that, and I'm not saying that, I mean, the value, they shouldn't question the value. That is undoubtable, and I support that. And they should keep questioning the value until we get value for money. But let's not lump up things as if nothing is happening in the global phase. A lot is happening, and it is moving very fast. And so where I was coming to land is the fact that, I mean, getting money in the capital market is becoming constrained. It's becoming expensive because of what uh, this ESG's requirement. So you just look at this. Let's play the devil advocate. Assuming ENI and Talu, as we speak now, they exit Ghana, we don't have upstream again. That's a fact. If ENI and Talu exit Ghana as we stop now, our upstream is collapsed. No, but if Talu not, and ENI decide to exit Ghana, it may only be because they've got another buyer. It may be a buyer that has expertise in um, ultra deep or deep water production, and that may not be an entire loss. That, that's why you are lucky. ExxonMobil have left. Have we gotten anybody? We are still struggling. So um, I, I, the, I, the idea, I know people don't, don't, don't buy into the idea of stranded asset. I, I completely subscribe to that. And then we are getting there. Okay. okay. So, so, so you... you, what I'm trying, you but, just so one. that's why I believe... If I, uh, sorry? Come just again, a quick you, one. So I wanted to ask, so you support the energy transition argument? Oh, yes. <laughs> and it's real. See, my company is typically upstream, and it's, uh, 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 I mean, uh, we call it petroleum development of Oman. Now, we just metamorphosis into energy development of Oman. If you look at the amount of transition, the amount of, you know, I mean, uh, uh, renewable energy push that is going on, even in that space, that is high. Okay, so, I mean, we don't have to sit down at a point in time that investors leave, and then we can't take care of our destiny. That's just what I'm saying. We need to have our upstream ritual. So questioning the figures is perfect. In fact, 
I, I'm happy about the whole thing because if you look at because of the uh, by Simon and the, I mean Ben Bochi and their critic, I mean their detailed and in-depth critic of the analysis. I think that you 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 just heard. I mean, we just heard that uh, we're going to have a Bank of America to do another evaluation. That's the beauty of the whole thing. So I don't want us to lump it as if everything is bad. No, no, no. That it cannot be bad. It cannot be bad investing in your upstream. That cannot be bad. Okay. So All right. Just, so, but <laughs> value for money is also paramount. I don't, I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Okay. But let's not throw into the bit. Okay. Go ahead. Just a quick one, and then I'll come back to the studio if you can answer this briefly. So I, I asked Ben Boache whether we should focus on one field, the pecan field, which is a development field. Good work has been done there, instead of focusing as well on the Nyankom field, which is exploratory and the, the resources are unverified, un unquantified. If we were to look at the deal again for, for a focus just on pecan, isn't that more realistic? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, if it's all about the risk profile, uh, like uh, Tio mentioned. See, before you enter into any of this field, you have to do a kind of what we call risk assessment in terms of your cost benefit analysis. And so if you look at that, of course, we are told that AGM uh, we haven't done appraisal yet, so we can say that I mean the risk profile in quantum wise is 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 is, is high. But Pecan Field, I, I believe, is been uh, in a way of I mean it's been the the risk to some extent. But where I was also looking at is the you know the Votain Basin. I thought also that's another opportunity we could have looked at, which is onshore. So depending on where we want to go, I think we should just do analysis of the risk profile, see where the risk is minimal because we don't have zero risk. We have to look at where we can minimize the risk to what we call as low as reasonable practicable, whereby your investment or the cost benefit analysis favor favor you. Okay. So yes, Pecan Field, of course. I mean, if you want to compare Pecan and AGM, I will go. I will, I will 100% say that Pecan in terms of risk profile is significantly lower than AGM. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Suleiman. Let me come back to the studio. Uh, interesting thoughts from him. Do you agree with the? energy transition argument and for the uninitiated energy transition is just really the movement from using what we know as the normal fuels you know petrol Con diesel and all that fuels. commercial fossil fuel, and moving into renewable energy like solar wind power uh, biofuels and the like yeah i mean what covid for example has actually done is to an extent catalyze the rate of the transition right what we don't know fully as yet is how the transition will pan out, right? How, so how it will the pan argument, out in the Africa, argument, in no, Africa or globally? Globally, including in Africa. So the argument really is that some say we have a 20-year window to maximize our oil resources because by that time you will have had renewables fully kicking in. Others also say, well, you probably are looking at a 30, 40-year window or we're even talking post-2050 before that happens. The point here really is that depending on the state of the world, you are being forced to think strategically about how these scenarios ultimately will play out. But in relation to um, uh, Yusuf's point, yeah. is that we have seen certain oil companies and majors make certain actions on the basis of what they perceive or feel to be the threat of the energy transition. And so we're seeing divestment of assets, et cetera, all over the place, and investment flows also possibly being curtailed as a result of, of that. That would have some impact on your upstream industry. It may have some impact even on oil market as well. That's all given, we know that. The question then becomes, as a country, what should you do in relation to this transition. Is it a threat or is it an opportunity? Because both ways would inform certain actions. So if you perceive it as a threat, and um, as sometimes we're try attempting to do here, then, okay, then let's quickly maximize our hydrocarbon resources and produce and, you know, um, and get out of there before you kind of lose those potential revenues. If you see the transition also as an opportunity, then okay, can you create or build new industrial clusters, for example, leveraging the new technologies that the transition presents? That's also another thing. 
but specifically in the context of the threat side of things, when it comes to upstream, does then that mean that because there's a transition and people are living, we should sell things or you know or, or um, um, buy it rather at any price that is being given to us? That is where a number of us really have the challenge. I we don't or personally, I don't dispute the fact that there is some transitioning happening. And that has affected the investment environment, which even to the extent why maybe companies like Aka and the rest are even struggling maybe to raise financing. And I use that advisedly, maybe, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that as a result of that, we should just go and buy the asset at whatever price that is being quoted. Mm. That, that really that is, I think, the distinction to... that needs to be made. All right. Uh Ben, your thoughts on whether really we will be significantly affected by the energy transition model. I, I find that maybe for Africa, we are still an emerging you know, continent. We are, we are growing. There's still a lot of movement. Um, lots of people are still buying cars. There's a lot of travel that's still to be done continent-wide. I'm just wondering really if that it's realistic to think that the energy transition will affect us significantly, um, which is why we, we must have a foothold or GMPC should take a foothold in this uh, deal. Yes, I think if uh, we have had a problem with GMPC using the transition as the, the, the basis for this particular transaction, and we've been careful to isolate the transition, the, the transaction from the entire transition conversation. And that is why if you check what civil society has been doing, we've been looking at this particular transaction and what it means for Ghana, what the numbers are, what the history of the block is. You know, the question about how Africa will be impacted by the transition, I mean, it's, research is still ongoing to really look at what the impact could be and where Africa will be uh, uh, in that space. And I see here the assumption that the world will not need the oil and Africa will still need it. And you speak to many people, that is the kind of conversation they want to uh, paint, that we have to continuously use uh, fossil fuel even if, if the world uh, doesn't need it. And that, for me, is, is an error <laughs> that we are making. We are assuming that if everybody in the world is moving to electric cars, the African will continue to use uh, 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 diesel-based or petrol-based cars. That is a wrong assumption. You have to speak to the African first to find out whether he is going to move into an electric car. And we have many aged cars around. So even for us to transit to uh, an electric car, if it becomes cheaper, could be faster than even in the West, where they have brand new cars and they are still producing some, they haven't stopped. So they have a much longer lead time uh, to even transition in terms of uh, automobile uh, than we have. And recently we saw the Ministry of Energy um, uh, commissioning an assembly plant of electric cars. Are we joking about that one? We need to speak to the people to gauge their appetite. Are they going to stay with fossil fuel cars or are they going to uh, uh, move to electric cars when it comes? So those are areas where research is still ongoing. Mm. So the specific question about this transaction is what we need to interrogate much more and you know examine the excuses that we are given on um, stranded assets. I mean, if you're talking about stranded asset, it is not Pecan that is stranded. Pecan is a, a project that is supposed to move into production. So the company decides to move into production or relinquish and go by our laws. It's not a stranded asset. The, your stranded assets are the ones that you have not discovered. Are you going to move aggressively to be able to make new discoveries by investing into exploration? And you're saying that the exploration, uh, exploration budget is you know, squeezed. Because the market is not responding uh, to investment in uh, 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 fossil fuels. So is GMPC going to take up that role and begin to explore? As we speak, they are operators of three blocks. They haven't drilled a well. And you learn by doing. You are in Talo. Talo hires contractors to drill. They don't drill themselves. So the drilling companies have the engineers that will support you to do the drilling and the necessary learning. And you progress to be an operator. Isn't the MODEC that is operating uh, Talos, managing Talos assets? Is GMPC going to be the 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 all-in-all -all operator with all the capacity that he claims he wants to learn to operate a block? What is it in, in an operator? 
Okay. It should grow. Okay. So those are the small screens we want to diffuse. To say that if you are talking about stranded asset, those are the assets you have not discovered. Those are the terrains that you are saying Exxon is hesitant. What are you going to do with that block? Are you going to go in there and explore for it? The market is not responding to oil investment. Why are we going to borrow the 1.65 billion if we wanted to uh, do that? Mm. There's a question. You know, without the budget coming in. Mm. There's a question here, and it's from Kwame. It says, My elementary understanding of the existing agreements between Ghana and ACA and AGM on one hand is that if these two companies fail to live up to the agreements with Ghana and they could not develop or find a buyer, the fields would revert to the Republic of Ghana as owners of these fields without the country having to pay anything at all. Can your experts throw some light on this for me? A few. Yeah, yeah, precisely. I mean, so um, what governs the relationship between ACA or any IOC and the state is the Petroleum Agreement. And within the Petroleum Agreement, there are specific provisions that um, says that, for example, during the exploration phase, if you don't develop or don't even find anything, um, then you relinquish parts of the block back to the state, which can then, they can then offload to the market. If you also decide that you're going to even leave entirely, even having made the discovery at some point, and you want to write down the, the value of the asset, that goes automatically back to the state, because by uh, our laws and by the Constitution, the asset or the resources are vested, I think, in the president for and on behalf of the state. If you read uh, Article 269, I believe, of the 1992 Constitution. Constitution. So yes, the question that is coming through um, is so absolutely then why right. Then why don't we, then why don't we rather so do it, that? It go, no, it goes back to what some of us have said, which is that why rush this? Because clearly, all the indications and things that um, at least I've seen so far indicates to me that th there seems to be some attempt to push through or force through the deal. And I'm like, okay, let's take a, a, a step back and actually interrogate not only the numbers, but you know, the bigger strategic imperative. So let's, okay, buy or say the argument about the transition is, is true or is happening. Um, what do you want to do at a wider government level in terms of your response, right, uh, to that? It surely cannot just be a piecemeal um, approach. So that's why, in my view, I've called and said that we need to really take a bit of a step back and begin to actually interrogate it. But the way it's being done and made to look like now, it just comes across to me like it's just been and remember, this is the same country where only seven, eight years ago, we sent eight petroleum agreements to parliament under a certificate of emergency, seemingly with bipartisan quote buy-in as well. And down the line, most of those blocks, people are not producing from it. So we, we have made policy mistakes in the past, and it looks as though we are repeating some of those same policy mistakes without taking a step back to reflect on why we are where we are. Mm. Uh, let me come to Dr. Suleimana. So why don't we rather take our time? I mean, there's no rush, don't you think? Yeah, I, <clears throat> thank you very much. Yeah, there is no, and I think that's uh, um, uh, what is currently ongoing. You know, the fact that, I mean, uh, they've elected, you know, uh, Bank of America, you know, to do further valuation. For me, if you get value for money, that is beautiful. And that's actually what is ongoing. This kind of talks up and down is actually leading to you know, a bit of focus. So what, what we need as, as people, as Ghanaians. So at the end of the day, um, this kind of talks, when you aggregate them, you know, um, it, will, it will bring, it will, it, will, it, will, it will illuminate what actually we are, we are aiming to get. So yes, value for money is, is, is excellent. But <laughs> if I just remember, Time is not waiting for anybody. I'm not saying we should rush this deal, but just remember the perspective that I'm talking about. I told you that in this industry, what Ben mentioned first that, I mean, and, and I think you also alluded to the fact that capital is not really available. Before capital wasn't available. And COVID had just catalyzed the whole system of, you know, how fast we want to go through this, uh, this journey, okay? And so it will come to a time that it is coming very soon that seeking money 
from the outside, I mean, from outside, where I mean, going to the capital market, there are going to be a lot of strings attached to that. And well, that will make borrowing very expensive. And so that's the aspect we are looking at. You can say, okay, Ghana, we, are, we have a particular situation. No, we are in the global community. Ghana, we are, we are still, you know, high, heavily dependent on borrowing from outside. Now, what about, the, what, what about when time comes that, I mean, there are a lot of bottlenecks in this borrowing that we cannot borrow, okay, and that we cannot invest in, into our asset. So I'm saying that we should not rush, but <laughs> there is no time waiting. I mean, we don't have time, uh, the maximum time waiting for us, you know, to, to, you know, to, to, to say, okay, I mean, uh, there's no need to rush this deal, or there's no need to rush, there's no need to rush this deal, or there's a need to rush this deal. What I am calling for is the fact that, I mean, GMPC and then the CSOs, I mean, they have to work together. That's paramount. Because if you look at everybody's calling in the same shots. So what is the problem? I think the problem is mostly about the numbers. But if you talk about the numbers and you, and you tend to negate this transition aspect of it, I think we are making a very big mistake. Okay, so from where I am coming from, so it is actually the NOCs, it, it is actually the, so just, let, 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 let me just land there just quickly. It is actually the NOCs who are championing energy transition. And I would stay categorical that I believe hydrocarbon resources will be with us for the next two decades, three decades, or maybe uh, four decades to come. All right. So if you flip the coin anyhow, whether transition is coming or transition is not coming, we just need to make sure that we retool our, our upstream. Let's not wait. Let's try to retool it, make it vibrant. So that in any eventuality that we have caught, you know, uh, flat footed, maybe any, anybody exiting, you know, without we prepared, and that, that, that is going to be a very big problem. So that's the argument. So I don't have any problem, <laughs> absolutely. If you understand me, I don't have any problem with what is going on. And I think it's perfect. It can only make our, our system very strong. It can only make our system very resilient and robust. And so that should go on. Why not invest in a field that is producing? We know that one of Talo or one of the Jubilee partners, Anadako, uh, has a, a new deal with um, Occidental uh, and another company in the U.S. Why not then buy an Adako stake? Why not buy stakes where they are producing? Money comes to you. And then you can use that to invest in maybe a virgin field that you're, you're not sure of. Isn't that more value that's, for money instead? That's, that's, again, it comes to a strategic decision. And GMPC has to be fully responsible for that. And so if whatever happened and the deal goes you know, where Ghanaians don't want it. I mean, GMPC will take full responsibility for that. So deciding whether, I mean, we want to invest into our existing field or want to go into an area that haven't been invested, it is just a matter of strategic decision. And so I don't really, I don't really uh, have problem with that. Yeah. All right. Then let's read some messages that have come to us. And this one from Aziz Inwa. And he says, I'm scandalized regarding the GMPC acre deal is obviously clear that some state actors seek to make money out of this. The inconsistency and rhetoric from the state actors is worrying to some of us because the amount of money going into this deal could have built some 300 brand new SHSs and it could again have constructed the dual carriage road from Nkoko to Kumasi to Hamile. In fact, the government should protect the public purse and stop the big grammar, fix the country now. Another message says, on the GNPC acre deal, I think the price sale on this is too high on the remaining, looking at what remains on the ground. It will be better for the oil to remain underground rather than for them uh, to take from Ghanaians. That's from Abladi, from Ifiakuma Zongo in Takradi. Uh, Abdul Razak from Boku says there must be transparency in this acre GNPC deal. We must get value for money. GMPC and government needs to come again. And Charles Nyame from Asaman Kesi writes, ever since the MPP government took over in 2017, it's been a chain of scandals, and this is the latest with the GMPC acre deal. And this is being attacked with such pure arrogance. And the sad part is the majority of Ghanaians who are suffering the consequences um, of this small group of uh, people who are benefiting god save ghana thank you very much for your messages you can send us some more on 055-369-8789 let me come back to uh, our studio guests so um mr Boachi, i think one of the criticisms for gmpc is that we've not seen them engage fully 
in an operatorship. And the view is that we need to see them demonstrate that this is an organization that has been criticized for receiving lots of money from their various uh, stakes and carried interests, and yet the money is deployed in manners that have been criticized. What should GMPC do to earn the trust of the public such that if really they want to become an operator, which was ideally part of their vision and should have oh, been implemented been been, yeah. by 2020 yeah. and the time has passed, what should they do such that we can have confidence that they will do it? I know you've mentioned that MODEC is an FPSO manager, not just even in Ghana, but in, in, in Brazil and, and Mexico. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, and even just before that, I want to touch on the investment conversation sure. a little bit. You know, we are making an argument that the market is not interested in oil operations. We are shifting focus, the market is shifting focus to renewables. And this is a new conversation where when the market is not interested, we are calling on the state to now go to the same market and say, instead of the oil industry securitizing the investment, the states want to securitize it. And that is a new conversation in this whole energy transition uh, conversation that we're having. Which country is doing that now? So if Ghana wants to go into that arena where we're using the budget to support GMPC's acquisition, we need to really interrogate that to ensure that the risks are really covered. Uh, otherwise, we're just doing the same thing. The market says they're not interested. You go and borrow more or less for development and you push into oil and gas. So it's, it's a question about whether you invest your borrowings into building schools, building hospitals, building roads, or go and use it looking for oil. And that is the, 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 the conversation that we've been uh, uh, you know, asked to engage in. And it's a very, very new terrain. That's what we're saying, that we need more time to dissect all the aspects of this transaction. It's not just the values. And it comes back to uh, your question about how does GMPC become an operator? And we have shown in our conversation that GMPC has just not been willing to be an operator. I, I, is it, over is it the fair year. to say they are, they are not willing? It's an expensive business. I mean, a lot of the companies <laughs> use their reserve-based lending See, to borrow, GMPC, and then they go back and renegotiate GMPC, with the banks. GMPC has spent on anything and everything apart from oil drilling. <laughs> and you know that. They are building schools, they are building hospitals. Which is not a bad roads. thing. That is not their job. Are they quasi government? They have corporate. They have corporate social responsibility. That so also do. Be so more also than do your they function. That cannot be more than. I mean, does Stalo spend more on corporate social responsibility than drilling wells? No. Does Ezon do that? There is no serious oil business that does that. And they have shown consistently that they are not interested in becoming an operator, because if you had to trade off, you know using $40 million to go and drill, or piling up your organizational structure, or ballooning your uh, staff from 300 to over 600, those are choices for a corporation to do. And they have chose to do the inefficient uh, 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 thing rather than becoming an operator. And we have shown that for all that we have given them for the past 10 years, about a billion dollars, they have not decided to use even $15 million to do the needful or to drill for a well. So the right thing to do, if, coming back to your question, is to go back to the blocks that they have taken as operators. If you are saying that you are an operator and you're holding on to the blocks and you cannot drill, then give it up. How, how about the suggestion that they could buy uh, into fields that are producing, for instance, and, and grow from there? Because it only takes money to get money. So if you, if you invest in a field and you are getting money, then at least you can invest it in another field instead of just investing and you're not sure if you are getting anything in return. No, I mean, that is also another conversation that we can have. And you cited uh, uh, the exit of Anadako, which is available. I think they are looking for about $600 million for a producing field. All right. But GMPC is not interested in that. They want to take one that they are not sure. It has to go in. And you know, Talo is here, uh, ENI is here, and all the three fields, the projected production, we never met them. All right? So there are risks until you get into production, before you really see what is possible uh, to be extracted from the ground. But they rather want to go into that risk, whilst, you know, they, they're making arguments that um, 
uh, uh, they don't need to go and drill uh, uh, and operate their field from the beginning. And what we are saying is that you don't need the tutelage or the apprenticeship that they are seeking from Acre to be able to become an operator. When Talo came, they were not operating giant fields. They used the same contractors, the same mess, the same slumbages, the same modex who are doing the work. And the engineers are also learning and they are procuring the engineers who can support uh, them to be able to operate the field. The amount of money that GMPC gets from Talos and all the companies for technology support can even procure or recruit the kind of engineers that GMPC wants with the relevant capacity to manage fields and operate them. So when they are talking about experience, I don't think they want to be uh, producing FPSOs or they want to be producing the subsea structures. What you're looking for is capable men who can design wells, who can be able to uh, detect you know, problems when they look at data. Those are the capable people you are looking for to be able to assemble the needed technology in the well to be able to manage a field. So what is this fuzz about? We want to be an operator, we want to learn, we want to spend so much time and bring in Ake as the, uh, as the, as the, uh, as, you know, the extraordinary company that can train you to become the operator. They are just refusing to do their needs for. Should we and that is the point we are, we, we are making to them. Dr. It wouldn't Champa. cost them $10 million to recruit the right men up and people. I mean, Dr. Yusuf is there. He works on the fields. It doesn't cost that much to do that. They are just refusing to do the need for. And just using that as, as an excuse to get the budget to support this kind of transactions. Mm. Dr. Champong, should our resource remain below the ground? Um, you, you need to exploit and extract it. I think the, the conversation picking up from where the Dr. 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 Yusuf and then um, uh, Ben have left off is really about the role or the strategic role of GMPC in the Ghanaian economy and specifically within Ghana's upstream sector, right? Because um, you look at the investment spend that GMPC has made over the last maybe 12 or so years since at least first oil and you try and analyze that vis-a-vis -vis their core mandate as defined in the, uh, the, uh, the law PNDC law 83, um, there are some questions, you know, um, rightfully so I believe, that they need to actually answer in relation to their core mandate of looking, exploiting and searching for oil. I think some people are making the argument now is that, okay, we made mistakes in the past. So give us another opportunity mm -hmm. to um, correct ourselves. that kind of uh, mistake. Um, but you know the the famous cheese saying, say you know, and I say something along the lines. So that's where I think some of the issues that people have comes from. But also the going forward, I think the bigger conversation really in relation to this whole mandate thing then becomes okay. If you want your national oil company to play a bigger role, maybe because of energy transition, maybe because other IOCs are living, et cetera, et cetera, where should they start focusing from? That's number one. Number two, you would have to amend, for example, in Ghana's case, the Petroleum Revenue Management Act to allow the national oil company, GMPC, to actually go and borrow on the market, because currently they are constrained from doing any reserve-based uh, lending um, as well. But even when we do all of those things, it comes back, okay, how then do we ensure, given the history, some of the things Ben is talking about, how do we ensure that they do not repeat some of these mistakes where in some years, the amount that is spent on, say, corporate social investment is the same as what you're spending in operational expenditure for one of your fields, right? It, it, you see some inherent inconsistencies in, in there. You can argue that, okay, GMPC is not just a national company. It has a national mandate. So maybe they need to buy the social license to operate. That argument is there. But at the core is that you need to grow the asset base. You need to increase and maximize the revenues before you can even make those CSR, CSI type investments. So I, I think 
we are having a, an important conversation here, which is really about what is the role of GMPC within this whole architecture of the upstream environment, given that some energy transition or whatever may happen um, at whatever point or period in time. And if we then need to retool the National Oil Company and even amend, say, the Petroleum Revenue Management Act to accommodate or allow them to buy, to borrow, to finance certain um, acquisitions, then we have to interrogate the quality of those acquisitions that are being made vis-a-vis -vis other investment options that are available to them. And that's where, you know, I, I, I think we need to have that, that conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Suleimana, you say that at least there should be an opportunity uh, to start. But the question I also wish to pose relates to our legislators. So there's a question about whether really they even delve deep into these issues. I know there have been some, there are some members of parliament who've, you know, um, been in the energy industry for a bit. But there's a sense that at the parliamentary level, these kinds of conversations should be what um, we have at the committee level or even have debated in parliament. We are not getting enough of that. And that is why by the time this kind of suggestion about, well, this is what we want to do comes out, there's a whole hula baloo. Yeah, uh, you, have, you are spot on. And, uh, and, I, and I can tell you that even though we are saying it is bipartisan, there are a lot of members from each side, whether NDC or NPP, who are terrible against, you know, the deal outright. Really? You know, That's so, not the sense I've gotten. Of course. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, of course. I can, I, I, I'm, I'm just telling you that, 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 that that's the whole thing. So, and that, 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 that is where the importance of, you know, agencies like CEOs will become very critical. See, I like the fact that the CEOs, I mean, they have been able to eliminate the whole idea and conversation is ongoing. And I can tell you that as long as these conversations are ongoing, I mean, we are getting to a point where we're going to get a very good deal. All right. So uh, Ben mentioned a point, you know, uh, and I think you also mentioned that point. GMPC, as a matter of fact, <laughs> they have to be focused. That's, that's emphatic and that's very clear. And so if you are focused as an NOC or a national oil, you know, a, a company, then your mandate has to be clear. And the mandate is there, it's waiting. See, we have a lot of, we are, if you go to the PRM, I mean, everything is well demarcated and well written. But unfortunately, for what, whatever reason, I don't know why we are able to follow this. And there are no punitive measures, uh, you know, when they, are di when they diverge, you know, from where they are commanded, nothing happens. For instance, I am terribly against holding onto blocks. You know, for my place, you cannot hold block more than 70 years. They will give you first three years another three years, then two years, that's all. And even the first two, th the first three years, the next one they're going to extend, they have to see something substantial going on. Remember, we are, we've been drilling oil, I mean, we've started extracting oil for over a decade now, uh, Jifa, and we cannot boast up to 200,000, you know, barrels per stream day. That is very, very unfortunate. I know there are a lot of reasons that might be accountable for this. Of course, Talo had some uh, challenges with the tariff, uh, the, the, the tariff bearing, and then COVID also came to play. And if you remember also, Talo had issue with, you know, the court ruling and other things. So, of course, the aggregate of all these factors will say that it has fed into, you know, why we are not able to achieve that target. But I think we've gone, I mean, we, we, we are far, far behind. I think by now we should have been targeting about 1 million barrels. But we are not there yet. Even the 200, we cannot. Okay. So that's why where I stand, I think that we have to make concerted effort. Let's keep bashing GMPC. That is an excellent to do. But let's not uh, say we should not make any attempt to do any investment. See, I, 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 acquiring access is an excellent thing to do. And like Ben mentioned, people are asking that GMPC, they don't have the state of art technology to do that. <laughs> you don't need state of art technology. I, I, that's why I go for acquiring the asset. See, when you have the asset and you are the majority shoulder, the beauty is you call the shots. Every employment, you have to take that. Every supply chain, hiring, Everything is done by you. And that's how can we control it. Talo is having a field, but Modet is the operator. Of, of course, they operate the ENI. I mean, they operate the, you know, the FPSO. So that's the whole thing. So that's why I think, I mean, acquiring the asset is an excellent thing. That is the only way. It is a panacea to take care of our destiny. 
However, the question that I've been asked, the issue of value for money, they are legitimate, and we need to keep hammering. Hammer to the extent that, but I, my fear is, I don't want it to hammer to the extent that we've, we, 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 we knock down the core mandate. I mean, we try to vitiate what our core mandate should be. So should we stop any activity in GMPs? No, we cannot do that. That's the only thing we have. So whilst we keep hammering for them to do the right, I think let's also make sure that we make concerted effort to retool GMPC. I mean, to make sure that they stay on their core mandate. And then going forward, I think the deal is just shadow with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, you know, dark, dark portions. And I believe that there has to be involvement, detailed involvement. Because I don't, I, I, I can't fathom Ben saying they are going to uh, kick us upon. And KK is also saying his doors are open. So, the, the, I, so definitely some, something is wrong somewhere. No. But at the end of the day, they say if two elephants are fighting, it's the grass that suffers. Ghanaians need to, to maximize the revenue from the oil. We need to create employment opportunity. We don't have time. And I'm saying that this energy transition is not a myth. It is actually not a myth. It is a reality. Though I still believe that hydrocarbon resources will be with us, especially in our part of the continent. But the beauty is that if you look at how the attack is happening from both upstream and downstream, it is phenomenal. Upstream, a lot of, sorry, downstream, a lot of EVs are coming. <laughs> but like Don uh, Ben mentioned, African continent, we don't have that infrastructure yet. And even the study was done, the amount of money that we need to catapult us into this transition journey is simply not there. And so that's how come some of us are calling the fact that let's invest into our world of hydrocarbon. Those who are very successfully into the, in the investment into their world of hydrocarbon, they are the same people who are very successfully in, in the energy transition journey. Because at the, at, the, at, at, at the end of the day, sometimes the proceeds from the world of hydrocarbon is what you have to use for energy transition. That's, that's a fact, and that's what is happening. And that's why I'm saying that our part of the world, it is the NOC that is championing energy transition, and they have a reason for that. Because gravitating from you know the world of hydrocarbon to the world of renewable, renewable it's not like a click of a mouse. It has to be about a concerted strategy, where even you have to move through what you call decarbonization strategically before you can get to the green economy. Thank you very much. And the problem is that um, if, if 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 you look at that's what I'm saying. The reason why I say time is not waiting. See, ESGs and the momentum they are coming. You go to the capital market and the kind of infringement and the kind of bottlenecks that are going to put around where you are going to borrow, you simply tell yourself that it's better not to borrow. And so that's my point. I don't okay. want us to get to a point where we are asking ourselves, well, how did you get here? All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Suleimana. And uh, we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll take uh, final comments from our studio guests and prepare for our next topic. Thank you very much for staying with us. It's hashtag the key points. You're welcome back. It's still the key point here on 3FM and TV3, also on DSTV 279 and also on 3news.com. And I guess the key points that we've gotten out of this whole discussion is that it looks like the valuation for this uh, GMPC acre deal is a bit on the high side. Uh, the other key point I guess we can uh, discuss is that we are unsure <coughs> of the uh, quantities below the seabed for which reason we'll be investing in, an, in a field that is exploratory. How about looking at a field that is producing and getting more out of that to do your additional investments? And certainly there is a need to engage civil society on what prospects are in this deal. But let me take final comments from our guests. Let me start off with uh, Ben Boachi. So looking ahead, what would you expect to happen? Do you want Parliament to you know, backtrack and say, look, maybe we need to take a second look at this? Or you would like GMPC to say, okay, we're going to do a bit more due diligence and come back? No, I think this has become like a national policy, for government policy, right? So what do we want government to do as a responsible government at this point is to now look at GMPC and say, 
over the last years, we have given you so much to do what you were set up to do, all right, over a billion dollars. The responsible thing to do now is to ask what we have done with that and how giving you more will bring us value. And that is what civil society is saying. We have to do that needful thing of examining whether GMPC even has the capacity to absorb further investment from the state. That is fundamental. And then we go into the specific transaction that we are dealing with to see how we generate revenue if, you know, the justification is for us to continue with that transaction. How do we generate value uh, for the Ghanaian people through that transaction? We are saying that the market is not interested in oil investment, but the state is the one going to borrow from the market and give it to GMPC. What is the risk associated uh, with that? We need to interrogate all of this to be sure that we are not going back into that cycle. Because if you drop another billion into an inefficient operation, you will still come out with nothing. All right. The reason why GMPC hasn't been able to optimize the one billion is because they have simply been inefficient at spending on their core mandate, ensuring that they can learn by doing. And that's what we are saying, learn by doing. You have taken three blocks as operator. Go and drill. Get the service companies to guide you and learn from it. Requ recruit the right experts. The 600 people that may not be needed, that is not your focus. You have to really make sure that you are recruiting the people who can help you start your journey to becoming the operator that you want to be. All right? The HES block is not a stranded asset. It's not part of the conversation when you're talking about stranded assets. You have blocks that people are not interested in, you say, and you are sitting on it, you are not exploring. That is a stranded asset. You have to make sure that every oil that is on that block can be discovered as soon as possible in the interest of you know, that argument of energy transition. Otherwise, we are only uh, throwing in names and te terminologies to confuse the average person All right. uh, without dealing with the substantive issues. And that's what we think uh, ought to be done now. Let's right. do that introspection and position the company to do the right thing before you drop any billion into them. All right. Dr. Champong. Yeah, I mean, in, in wrapping thoughts. up, yes, I, I, like I said, specifically on this deal, some of the numbers need a bit more scrutiny. Um, the government says that they have got Bank of uh, say America or somebody to help them look do at that. It again. Um, subsequently, when those numbers come, of course, we'll interrogate it. Um, and when the deal that they propose to bring back to Parliament, I'm sure we'll also get the opportunity to um, to interrogate it as well. Um, but the bigger conversation, in my view, really, um, back to some of the things Ben and you see have said, is uh, a bigger national conversation on what we want to see the oil industry in Ghana in the next 10 years. We've done the first 10. Um, what lessons have we learned from that, that position, positions us going forward for the next decade vis-a-vis -vis the transition? That, I think, we need a, a bigger stakeholder forum or dialogue to really dig deep on these um, set, set of issues. But as it stands now, I, I unfortunately don't even think that oil is the panacea to our development. Thank you. All right. And your final uh, comment, uh, Dr. Yusuf. Yeah. So thank you. I think I shared with, uh, uh, with uh, Ben and uh, Tio's uh, submission. First of all, GMPC has to be focused, really, because all these questions are coming <laughs> because of past history. But I always repeat that you don't judge, you use past history to say that, okay, we are not going to do anything at all. Let's fold our hands, arms and say that, no, we cannot do that. We need to retool our upstream. Our upstream is begging, you know, for retooling. And so, and I think this is one of the starting points. Let's keep hammering the numbers. And the beautiful thing is that this kind of composition should, should go on. And going forward, uh, Jifa, I think <laughs> GMPC, they have to involve the CSOs in most of the deliberations. I think they have beautiful ideas. And for all you know, I mean, we are all fighting for one country, which is Mother Ghana. If we save it at the end of the day, that is good. All right? So, but the kind of animosity whereby somebody says somebody is anti ghanaian or that, I think that will not aga well for us. So going forward, let's keep on hammering to get the best out of the deal. Now, finally, what I want to say is that, uh, though it is a little bit tangential, see, we have existing players. Fortunately, we still have Talo and Ian who are still entrenched within our shores. And I think that's an excellent thing to do. I mean, that's an excellent thing to go. What I do know is, Ghana, we have to be able to maximize 
our gas recovery in particular. Though this is, I'm saying this tangential, but I'm saying that because from my study, what I noticed is the fact that some of the reasons why we've not been able to optimize our production is because of offtake issues in terms of our gas. So that's very critical. So going forward, the government of Ghana, let's look at that. <laughs> Especially if you look at tallow fields, it is associated gas. So you don't get the oil when you cannot displace the gas. And that is key. All right. So that's where, where I'll end. Uh, I'll, I'll just end here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suleiman. And it's uh, very interesting you brought up the gas conversation. And I think there will be an opportunity for us to really talk about gas because that's a whole different uh, uh, kettle of fish entirely. Yes. And, and, and I think that's something we need to do. We need to do. But I want to say thank you to our guest, uh, Dr. Suleimana, who is an energy analyst. Many thanks to Dr. Theo Achampong. And to you, of course, Ben Bwachi. Really appreciate that you've uh, put your expertise before all of us today. Much appreciated. And some of you have sent your messages already. Uh, let me take them. This one from Farouk in Tamale says, Seriously, the GMPC acre deal is another Ejapa family deal. Hashtag fix the country. This one uh, from Pake at Elembele says the GMPC acre energy issues, the level of secrecy in this whole deal is a matter of concern. In fact, I don't see this government doing anything extraordinary in the upstream and downstream sectors of our uh, oil and gas industry. The government is only benefiting from what the NDC government put in place uh, prior to uh, their exit and those were some of your messages thank you very much and remember it's hashtag the key points live on tv3 and 3fm and uh, in our next topic the ndc has been mounting a strong defense for its uh, electoral reform proposals and uh, they've been speaking about it and it's been a debate about which comes first as well constitutional reform or we go straight to making certain amendments which are easier, changing the rules of court and the like to ensure that we have some electoral reforms. So all of that coming up next, our guest is Elvis Ifrie Ankara, the NDC's Director of Elections, and Albert Kofi Ahen, a former uh, Director of Elections at the Electoral Commission. We'll be bringing that to you shortly. But let's hear uh, Nana Atudazi and Professor Kwame Nahoy that addressed the media recently about these issues. We would urge His Excellency the President to accept the interpretation of the Apex Court, that the Supreme Court, as the correct interpretation of the Constitution and the law, and proceed to urgently activate the processes for the early implementation of the constitutional reforms as set out by the Constitutional Reform Committee on 20 December 2011. They did not show us which problems they were trying to solve. Nobody has complained about voting hours in this country. So why would you ignore all the problems that we are seeing and then jump to try to resolve uh, an imaginary problem about voting hours, thereby suggesting that we should be closing polls by 3 p.m. It defies uh, logic. This business about take it to IPAC is ex post facto. That's why sometimes you see by their own conduct, they create the impression as if perhaps somebody is pushing them to do something. But this is the official response. That response was very clear. We have received your proposals and we will get back to you. Send to the Electoral Commission. So what then is the basis a few days or weeks after go to IPAC? IPAC meetings are called by the Electoral Commission. So when we submit a proposal to the Electoral Commission, it is the responsibility of the Electoral Commission to table it at the IPAC meeting, which it convenes. So for me, it baffles me that it says we should table it at IPAC. As I said, let her show us the iPad secretary. We'll go and table it there.
Thank you very much for joining us on The Key Points Live on TV3 and 3FM. And today we are talking about the NDC's electoral reforms, probing the proposals, assessing the viability. And I know we had an initial discussion on this some two weeks ago, but at that time the NDC hadn't really fully come out. But this week uh, they've put up uh, a strong defense of their proposals and it's raised a lot of discussions about what comes first, what What's the priority? Do we engage in constitutional reform to get some of those reforms they've put forward through? Or do we amend the rules of court? Do we amend the Political Parties Act that will allow for some of the other reforms which seem probably more doable uh, to go through? Uh, today we welcome Elvis Efriye Ankara, the Director of Elections for the NDC to our studios. Good morning and welcome Mr. Efriye Ankara. Good morning Jifa and it, thank you very much for having me. It's been quite a while. Yes, yes, yes. Great. I haven't seen you since uh, yeah, it, your since... other incarnation. <laughs> <laughs> Let's also um, welcome uh, Albert Kofi Ahen, who will be joining us via Zoom. But let me start with Mr. Efriye Ankara. So with the NDC's views about electoral reform, there are questions about whether this is about how you felt treated, how the party felt treated during the 2020 elections, or has the NDC really been on a mission over a period to, you know, put forward their views about how we can improve our electoral system? Thank you very much. Um, that's a very good question. Um, let me start by putting the issues in context. So you recall that after the 1992 elections, the MPP boycotted the parliamentary elections because they felt that the processes were not fair and transparent. And so we had virtually an NDC in Parliament with the Eagle Party. And so civil society, uh, donor community, everybody felt that you needed to create a platform where the then opposition will have the opportunity to also spell out their grievances and issues. And that's how come IPAC was born under Dr. Kujia Farijan. So IPAC was born to create a platform where we could generate consensus on electoral issues and put in place systems, mechanisms, processes, and procedures to improve upon our electoral system. Because you know that the law, the, the law is very clear about the, electro, the independence of the Electoral Commission. However, when it comes to practical governance, stakeholder consultation is a key component of practical governance and administration. So the IPAC has been able to churn out a lot of reforms that has enhanced our entire electoral architecture. For example, moving from opaque ballot boxes to transparent ballot boxes, moving from um, uh, uh, the introduction of counting of votes at the polling station and declaring same, the use of photo ID cards, the biometric register that we have today, uh, to the extent that uh, at the time that they were even going to procure the first biometric register, there were two committees that were formed at the IPAC, a technical committee and a legal committee. And therefore, even the constitutional instruments, CIs that are drafted and sent to parliament, the political parties had an input. And then when it comes to the procurement of a biometric or other equipment, the political parties, the technical committee also had an input. And so that was how the IPAC evolved and it's been very, very useful. So after the 2013 Supreme Court decision, you know, the MPP went to court. The court, in giving its verdict, actually pro pronounced that the EC should reform itself. And so consequent to that, the EC then set up a committee. And I have the committee's report here, a report of the Electoral Reform Committee submitted to the Electoral Commission of the Republic of Ghana, April 2015. And you can see the membership. We had Judge Naupokwa, Mankwa, Mrs. Rebecca Kabuki, Ajal, these are all members of the EC. Johnson, I see Don Ketia represented the NDC. Kwabna Jia, Japan represented the MPP. Um, Mr. James Kwabna Bonfe represented the CPP. Mr. Enin Kofi Ado representing the YPP. Dr. Ransford Jambo, Jampo, member representing the IEA CSOs. Mr. Kwesi Jonah, member IDEC. And then Dr. Franklin Odro from CDD. And Mr. Christian Usupari was the secretary. So they came out with a number of reforms, about 15 or so. Now, 
these reforms came towards the latter part of Dr. Farijan's tenure. Mm -hmm. And so he couldn't do anything about it. And then Madame Charlotte Osei came in, and then she was also preparing for the 2016 election, so she couldn't do much about it. And we all know she was removed. Madame Jemensa came in, and uh, Madame Jemensa inherited these reform recommendations. Um, unfortunately, she was not able to implement any of them. And we also found that she took a posture that the EC is independent and uh, she's not bound by IPAC decisions. And therefore, she was not very open to that consensual process that we all had at IPAC. What we found was that over a very short period of time, about 11 political parties were registered. And so you go to IPAC and you have all manner of parties. And then when discussions are had and we come, normally what happens is that issues that we agree on, we move them forward. Issues where there's no consensus, we stand them down. And then we continue the consultation process behind the scenes. In fact, when she was at IEA, she was, a, she was very instrumental in resolving issues through the political parties platform. So issues that were contentious, we move out of IPAC, we go to the political parties platform, we delegate, we, de we debate, we discuss, and then we arrive at a consensus. So she then brought in a lot of these political parties. And then when issues come to the crime, they say, okay, then let's vote. But is it fair yeah. to say she brought in the political parties, new political parties registered for the 2016 elections? Okay, so the 11 political parties appeared during the <laughs> And then, they, what, I'm just telling you the practicality of what happened. I get but, you. But, 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 that's, but that's, 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 aside, that's just beside the so point. The, so, so, hold on. So, voting was not part of the normal process in, in, IPAC, in, the, pa in the past. But subsequently, you know, in in, in yes. during Mrs. Mensah's era, that has, exactly. that's what has and then, happened. And then you see the spirit and posturing, you know. Uh, it, there was something went wrong, and you know, we will not listen to you. I'm sure you know about uh, people saying the NDC is a threat to Ghana's democracy and all those things. So the whole environment was not congenial. And after the elections, usually after elections, what happens is that, again, it is the uh, um, political parties together with CSUs, they then discuss the needed reforms. But again, the EC had a meeting and brought out four reforms. Okay, hold so, on. The, the, the CSOs and the political parties did have a post-mortem. Mm -hmm. CDD, Kodeo mm -hmm. had that event mm -hmm. in Ada. Mm -hmm. But you chose we as the, the NDC, yes, you were at the yeah. Kodeo event, mm -hmm. but you chose as the NDC not to be at the EC uh, two-day workshop. Yes, because we, we felt that we will not legitimize a process that will not produce genuine and sincere and enduring reforms. As I told you... But, but weren't you, you just being judgmental? Because the elections were over, there's really nothing to, to fight about anymore. You no, know, the, if, if the elections were over, and that is all the more reason why you needed a very open and transparent process in a very congenial atmosphere to discuss you didn't the issues. You didn't have that, so you we, felt so, 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 you so, wouldn't we, proceed So, then. so we, we, did, we did a temporary boycott of IPAC, and it's important for people to understand that boycotts are legitimate tools in a democracy, particularly when it's temporary. When you do a temporary boycott, for instance, when people walk out in parliament, it becomes news. Why have you walked out? Then you now explain, because we've tried to use the platform to bring out issues consistently and it's, it's not been working. Mm -hmm. So we felt that if we stay, we, we, we become part of that process where there was no room for consensual ideas, especially from our side, and there will be legitimizing that process. And so we took a step back and said, okay, let's go back and look at the entire electoral architecture. Because over the years, in, in any case, every electoral system needs to be fine. It's like a vehicle. You always need to go for servicing, change the plugs, and change the oil, and make sure that the system is fine-tuned. What is our current electoral system? What has been our experiences in the past? Against the backdrop of the reform proposals that have not yet been implemented, and then what we experienced in 2020, what then can we do? 
So it's not just about 2020. 2020 was a catalyst. It was a key factor, no doubt about it. But we had to look at the entire electoral architecture. We've been doing this for almost 30 years. What are the things that have been impeding the smooth functioning of our democratic process? What can we do to ensure that the systems, the mechanisms, and the institutions are, are, are strengthened such that at the end of every electoral process, we would, we would all be satisfied. For example, in 1992, when the young people were not satisfied with the system, they wrote the stolen verdict. When they now brought reforms, and it's instructive to note that most of the reforms, opaque ballot boxes, uh, transparent ballot boxes, and all those Color things, ID uh, cards. ID, most of them, most of them came from the MPP. And the NDC at that time, the government in power, we, we, went, we went along with them. You know, and Dr. Farijan created the atmosphere for us to have those kinds of reforms. So it helps. So reform really does enhance the electorate. So we went back and then we looked at, so we formed a team. And when we formed the team, we said, look, because we are partisan people, we will not um, lead. So we'll get uh, people who are, you know, they're part of the party, but based on their background experience, they have the broad knowledge and a little above partisanship and they they evoke a certain you know national appeal exactly okay and, so and that's the, why you the, had what so Nana uh, Nana Tudazi, Tudazi and Professor Professor Kwame Kwame Ahoy. so we as ndc we also submitted our proposals to them mm. and then they they also spoke they looked at existing electoral reforms the, the 2015 reforms so they looked at the reform document that yeah. existed then they looked at international and domestic literature on electoral reforms they looked at international best practices on electoral systems they conducted interviews with some former top management staff of the ec they examined our position paper and they had access to some documentation from the ec so following that out of that came the reforms this. that yeah. we that and the NEC has put forward exactly. so we realize that these are proposals technical proposals so let's then move the next step forward and i engage civil society and other stakeholders so we've met a coalition of cso's we met a whole uh, i understand you've met the tuc we met the tuc we met organized labor, labor. you know there's a group okay, that so are outside the yes, tuc then we met the tuc too we've met the u.s embassy uk high commission mm -hmm. canadian high commission We've met the EU delegation and member states. We've met Christian leaders. We've met the NDC Professional Forum. We've met the National Peace Council. We've met Muslim leaders and so many others. Nice. So we try to subject this to them. Okay, th these are our propositions. What do you think? Okay, so this is not an idea that some people have a perception that it's because the NDC feels aggrieved mm -hmm. about how its relationship with the Electoral Commission, specifically the chairperson, deteriorated. And so these reforms don't stem from that. I, I mean, it will, be, it, will be, it will be untruthful to say. It's a part of it. It's a part of it. But, but it's, it's broader. Not, it's not the, yes. the foundation. It's, it's broader. It's not predicated it's on broader. that. In fact, when we met the TUC, they said, um, you people, you sound very nationalistic. Um, are you sure that in the event that you win power, in 2024, you are going to uh, implement these reforms. And one of them actually took a snapshot. The chairman took a snapshot and said, I'm going to hold you to your word. And so we tried to go beyond ourselves and say, look, Ghana as Ghana, we've been having several elections. What can we do to improve upon the electoral system? And so based on all these discussions, we've had a lot of fantastic feedback. And uh, the discussions are still ongoing. And we believe that the discussions can only enrich the final input. We've sent a copy to the Electoral Commission. They've, they responded, actually, and told us that it's been looked at. And that, um, so we intend to also do an addendum based on the feedback that we've gotten from. So we've, we've collated all the views and inputs, and then we'll send an addendum. And then subsequently, we'll all meet and then look at it. Okay, based on the feedback you've received so far, which of these, and I know there are some 10 key reforms that are like the big yeah. uh, issues, which of these reforms, for want of a better word, are gaining traction? Okay, so... Um, let, let me deal with what we consider okay, so, to be Okay, our, so what's the big, yeah. the big okay, okay. Um, reform issues for you? Okay, so the first of all, we, 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 the first thing is that we think that the process for appointing the electoral commission now nah, and the commissioners, it's problematic. And uh, we proposed that 
indeed the EC chairperson, um, yes, she'll go through the um, process, she'll be appointed by the president in consultation with the Council of State. But because the president is also an interested party in an election, more often than not, the EC is then seen as the MPP's EC, NDC's EC. So what you do is that you subject her to prior approval by parliament. The parliamentarians are the representatives of the people. So when she goes through that process, and with the chairperson of the EC, we're asking for two-thirds of the members of parliament. So if you're an EC chairperson, and you know that you're going to go and face parliament, and two-thirds of the people are the ones that are going to approve you, it means that, first of all, in even making the choice, the president in making the choice and the Council of State in advising will look out for somebody who has a broad national appeal. That's very important because you know that you're going to, you need two thirds of the members of parliament to get them through. So the names, when you're doing your shortlist, you, this name will come up and say, no, this name will not fly because this name is either two NDC or two MPP. But you get somebody who all the parties will have relative confidence in the person. So that would help a, a, a lot. So that, that requires the amendment of Articles 43.2 and 72 of the 1992 Constitution mm. because mm. the commissioners are appointed by the president. And I think that's also um, entrenched. Mm. And then the I know that that definitely go, will go through a very long process. Yes. Um, but, one of but the, that's, that's something you, you would one, like. One, one of the feedback we got from uh, TUC, uh, was it, or no, the Christian community, is that we should also go further and break this down into short term mm. and long term. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so th that's perhaps be one of the things that we will look at it, not even long term, but medium term. Mm -hmm. Because the Constitutional Review Commission, of which the current EC chairperson, was a member, recommended prior parliamentary approval. And the government white paper on the Constitutional Review Committee also accepted that recommendation. And you know that we are in the process of people are talking about Constitutional Review, Constitutional Review, Constitutional Review. So it, it, I don't think it's for nothing that people are talking about it. You know, a democracy must be responsive to the voices of the people. After 28 years of democracy, I think it's about time we start looking at that. So. Even though it may not be immediate, it's something that I think it will not be long term but medium term because the pressure is growing. We need to look at the whole constitutional architecture. So that's one. Mm -hmm. Then the second one is that um, repeal of the requirement of, for, for the consent of the AG to be given before the prosecution of electoral offenses. Mm -hmm. As we sit here today, for some strange reason, PNDC Law 284, 1992. The states representation that, of the people's. Exactly. Act that it, 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 it finds some, an animal called electoral offenses. So ordinarily, when I, God forbid, I slap you, it's assault. The police will prosecute me. But if that slapping happens within the context of an election, then the law says that you needed the written consent of the attorney general before I can be prosecuted. This is why there's been so many cases of impunity. I mean, you know about how Akumso, she herself considered that she fired a gun at a polling station. Eight people have died in an election. Nothing has happened to them. Because... And the case has been discontinued the, by the police. That's what we're hearing now. Yeah. So it creates a culture of impunity. And because the attorney general, who is a cabinet colleague of these appointees, uh, will find it very difficult to prosecute them. But if you take away that requirement, then the police can go ahead and prosecute them. And you see, but what difference will that make? The police is also an institution of state where the IGP is appointed by the president. It could be that there will also be still political interference from the it, highest office it, of the presidency, and so they may still not prosecute. So, 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 so then, then it means that nothing will work in Ghana. Is that, is that what you're saying? Because ordinarily, when you slap somebody, it's assault. The, that requirement of prior written notification from the AG creates it's a, a It's problem. a barrier. It's a barrier. And so when you remove that, then everybody will know that, look, there's no barrier. If they don't prosecute, then we'll know what to do with it. But okay, so that, that requires hide. the amendment of, of that law. But it doesn't have to, it's, it's not a constitutional, it's not a constitutional, uh, constitutional, uh, constitutional one. So that for you is doable in the short term. Exactly. Then, of course, the special designated courts that can be done be through done. regulation. Yes. You know, and then, of course, um, the, the removal of names from yes. the register, those are not very 
Um, we'll come back to the Equal GBC. Equal access to GBC yes, yes. by political parties. Yes. I really marvel that you raised this because Why? we are now in an era of um, digital media. Mm -hmm. The NDC is streaming mm -hmm. its activities live mm -hmm. on, on Facebook, on social media. You even have some... Uh, online television stations mm -hmm. favorable to your cause. I've seen instances where you've advertised even the recent press conference mm -hmm. last week and you welcome everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, people come in and you don't turn them away. I think you are getting more media than ever before and GBC covers you as well. Why has this suddenly become an issue? It, do, do you know that for the past couple of years, GBC has, GBC has never covered any of our press conferences. Yes. Even this most recent yes, one? Yes, yes, That will yes. have to be verified. Yes, you can verify. It. I'm telling you for a fact. The major but has difference... It, but has it, if GBC doesn't cover, has it really impacted? Everyone knows about these reforms, on, for no, instance. No, the major difference, Jifa, is that Media General is private. You can decide to come or not to come. Mm -hmm. All the other platforms, they are private. Mm -hmm. GBC is not private. It's so they don't have a choice. It's a national broadcast. They are paid by the taxpayer, all of us. And indeed, there is a decided case, Supreme Court, GBC, MPP, New Patriotic Party, Party. incidentally. Yes. <laughs> I remember it was J.H. Mensah. It was J.H. Mensah that, that took that matter Supreme to court. Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report 354. It's clear. So it, you have situations where the president and any president... NDC, MPP, any president at all during election period, he's a cutting swords, he's commissioning projects, he's given six, seven hours, and then they'll give you ten minutes. Okay, but so is that, also, law, but is that law, also a bit, is that fair to any incumbent the, government? The law, the, those the, lines the, are very thin. Jiva, I think that it's a, it's, a, it's a decided case. Okay. Okay, so it has to be implemented. implemented. I don't want us to dwell Let's too much not dwell, on that. Okay, now, but just the, a quick next, one on that. Mm. But have you had any formal engagement, for instance, with the current Director General about this concern? Our that communication you have? Uh, director has done it several. They will agree, all right, but you know, it's, it's a funny thing. So we, so, we believe so, they are not being fair to us, okay. and we think that within the political environment, GBC, which is a state-sponsored uh, finance entity, must obey the Supreme Court. Okay, so if they don't obey the so Supreme Court... So let's go to court, proposal number six. No, just a quick... So if they don't obey the Supreme Court, then what? You go back to court? We'll look at it, our no. legal people. Now, the proposal number six is that IPAC should be backed by legislation through an amendment to the Electoral Commission Act 1993. And we say that the IPAC has served Ghana's electoral system well, but because it's informal, the EC tends to ignore some of its concerns or even to marginalize it. And so depending on the leadership style and posturing of a particular EC chairperson, and as I gave you the example of Dr. Kujo Afarijan, who was very amenable, the, 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 you know, that, their attitude was like, let's bring everybody together. So if you have somebody else who feels, look, IPAC is not important. And yet the same person then goes to form a what, uh, eminent persons group or committee or how, what's the name, Kra? I, I, okay. I don't recall Now, that name. formation of the eminent persons is a tacit and silent admission that even though the EC is supposed to be independent, it needs external feedback. It needs advice. It needs advice. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we think that I've given you copious examples of major reforms that have enhanced our electoral process. Emanating that came from, from IPAC. IPAC. And therefore, it is important that we, go, we look at this carefully. And indeed... The EC's own electoral committee in 2015 made this recommendation. It was adopted by APAC, accepted by the EC at the time. So we need to look at it. What, 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 what are the, we, so the EC is independent. But what will be the functions of IPAC, for example? Who attends IPAC? You see, when we, we, we say this things, people misinterpret it and say, oh, we don't want the smaller political parties. The, in representation, there has to be a certain logic, okay? Right now, the NDC has 137 seats, MPP has 137 seats. Other parties don't have any seats. When the Madame Jemensa again was at the IEA, she formed a political parties platform. She insisted that it will be made up of parties with representation in parliament. Why is that? 
because there's a certain logic to it. If you've participated in an election, you are a major stakeholder, you've won seats in parliament, you then have a stake. Again, the you same... That, the, you, the, just the, a quick one. No, you said there was logic to it, but mm. IEA is also a private institution, and they define based on the resources they have... So, so I'm... So I'm coming back to, mm -hmm. I'm coming back to uh, EC, mm -hmm. IPAC. At the EC, IPAC, I told you we've had two committees, a technical committee and a legal committee. The technical committee had Dr. Queno as a member representing the NDC and Mr. McMenu of the MPP. Usually they will have um, Kabila or somebody like that as a member. From the CPP. From, from the CPP. Or worst case scenario, they will take two people. As you saw in the electoral, the smaller parties. as you saw in the electoral reforms the membership that I read, there were two people representing. Why did they not say that we have thirty-five political parties and therefore every single political party must have a member? But that's just a committee. It's a committee, but there's a logic. Do you understand me? I'm saying there's a logic to it. Okay, okay. So you have NDC represented, MPP mm -hmm. represented. Why didn't they say that every single party must be represented? That's the logic I'm talking about. Okay, but that's just one committee. IPAC no, is the... No, uh, IPAC, it, 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 both the legal uh, uh, okay, and so the, the, the which technical Which are subcommittees of the wider IPAC. Yes, but it is the, the logic. Does it not make sense that in a situation where you have two major political parties and then other smaller parties, in decision-making, there must be some weight as to the inputs of the parties for instance, in terms of deliberation and everything, every Ghanaian can state his case. But when it comes to critical situations, where, for instance, even if you have to vote, you cannot have the same vote. A party that has not participated in any election, has no representation in parliament, has no offices. That, that is a different matter altogether. But we're saying that when it comes to critical issues that impinge on the future of our elections, there needs to be a clearly defined rules. Otherwise, you have a situation where, when I say it, you say, well, um, 11 parties appeared. And what we saw was that those parties, when they came in, it appeared as if they came in just to heckle us out of the way so that we won't have a voice. And the, the whole idea about IPAC is for us to have meaningful inputs. How do we resolve that? We need to discuss it as a so, country. So you admit that there is the need to resolve that because at the end of the day these other political parties are also supported by Ghanaians exactly. who want some input at IPAC. It may also not be fair to say that well the two of us, MPP, NDC, we are the biggest. So because of that it's only our voice that matters. No, that, you see you, you're getting it wrong. I, the voice of every Ghanaian matters. Mm -hmm. Every Ghanaian People must, matter, you people matter. People matter, you matter. You know, NDC. But in terms of, it, that is why in some countries they have proportional representation. We don't have. Mm -hmm. But I've given you case studies mm -hmm. of even the IEA and the EC itself uh, in constituting committees for IPAC. There's a certain logic mm -hmm. about the representation. They take into account the fact that, look, these are the two major parties. The other parties, they are important, but because of the weight they have, we will give them maybe two, three, four references. I mean, that, 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 there's it's, a it's worry though. Yes. There's a worry though that we may be creating a monster by clothing IPAC with a legal framework. So we've seen political parties have representation in parliament, you know, virtually have that representation vanish. If we had a legal framework, that determined that it was for only political parties with, with representation in parliament, for instance. It will mean that by now, those parties will find themselves on the back end. So, so, so that is not what we are proposing. I get that. Okay. I get that. So, I, I, so, I get so, that. But so, I'm just so, thinking of the scenarios. Exactly because that, whoever thought that, like the CPP PNC, so, so, will not have any representation. So, so in that parliament, is why we are not. thought that we'll have a near split that, parliament. That is why today. we are not making that argument. Okay. Our argument is that there has to be a certain logic. logic. I mean, this is not very difficult. Unless I, I, I understand. Somebody, there has to be a certain logic about when we go to IPAC. Okay? Who the same, who votes? The same logic. All the parties, if there's room, if we have 100 parties, they, they will should come and participate. Uh -huh. They but should it's about discuss. The, for you, you are concerned about the votes and those things. The, the decision-making. Okay? 
there has to be some there has to be some who, fairness who would determine what those guidelines or legislative rules would all be? of us okay you see that is why these proposals are out there but as if we are, somebody as we feels are that they will be disadvantaged as, as, they will as not we support. are speaking so so in 20 uh, uh, 1992 hmm, we won by 58 uh, percent isn't it right proposals came for reform we could have said as a party that i won't agree so the key issue is these proposals do they make sense would they enhance our electoral process I mean, these are the issues that we should look at i know some people are concerned that if you legislate let's look at it let's listen to the diverse views you know and i, I guess uh, our, our research team just saw this ipac must be regulated by law and this was on the 7th October 2013. And it was by none other than Gabi Asari or Chedako. I'll send it to you. Okay. So, so, so. So, so yeah. So, so IPAC, that's something that you believe can be done in the short term if there is a certain will exactly, to make it happen. Exactly. We will all agree on the rules and then we'll take it forward. Right. Legislation should also by the chairperson of the EC as the returner of some of the presidential elections to, to, to you, you, you know, the introduction let me link that to one of the uh, part b reforms mm -hmm. we felt that the introduction of the regional coalition yeah. centers was problematic yeah there was no proper guidelines no, to guide and, and, and how the, it was implemented and the, and the eu um, uh, reports eu election observer mission report says is page 41 is very clear yeah. page 41 is very 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 clear and um, what is stated very clearly about the lack of transparency in the way and manner in which the regional coalition centers came up. And indeed, the question is, in the past, you always had a resource coming from the constituencies sent directly to the EC headquarters. And then uh, the uh, party agents would check, and then the results are declared. What happened? What was the problem? We've had seven elections, and we've had no problem. And then you bring in uh, 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 regional coalition centers, and that rather led to so many problems. And where for the first time in the history of this country, you've had situations where the electoral commissioner announced so many, many different results. It, it shouldn't happen. So we feel that that is a no, no, so, no. So issue. there should be no regional coalition? It's, it's, it's not necessary. It's not necessary. Because you see, at the constituency, at the polling stations, the results are declared, then they are collated at the constituency. Yes. Okay? So the agents take their results and they send them to their agents in the strong room. Mm. And the EC also sends same to the strong room. So by the time the EC's results arrive, our party agents also have also ours. Have okay? But you have a situation where we send our constituency results more often than not. And again, it's in the EU report. You had your, there, you there had were, your there, data. There were differences in, in the summary. Mm -hmm. Because the, 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 the regional results were a summary of the various constituencies. constituencies. So you, there was no transparency to see the individual exactly. con uh, Const constituency exactly. results. And, and we've had case Isn't studies, case studies I, I where, mean, where there were actually differences. If you, if you go to the AC website today mm -hmm. and you take all the regional, the system regional summary sheets and you add them up, and you take the various consequences and you add them up, there's a difference. There's a difference. And we shouldn't allow these things to, to happen. So is, is there a way to make the regional coalition efficient? Because it seemed like a, a fantastic idea, such that the headquarters would then receive only 16 results, no, but, as opposed but you to see, there's, 275. There's, there, there, there's even a, an issue as to the legality of it. And I think our lawyers should look at it. The chairperson of the Electoral Commission is the sole returning officer for the presidential elections. She's the sole. So what is the legal mandate of the uh, regional, uh, regional the coalition? Regional so. coalition. In, so, fact, in fact, what, what the CI says is that regional coalition officer. Mm -hmm. So there's no architecture there, unlike the constituency and the national uh, coalition center at the, mm -hmm. at the strong room, so-called, mm -hmm. where there's an architecture and there's a system and there's a process to do the checks and balances. At the regional level, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and we are asking that, they say, if it's then broke down, fix it. So we should go back to the old system, the which old works system, well. Which has been working very, okay. very well. All and right. indeed, communication between um, um, constituencies and the national is sometimes even faster, faster. if you know Ghana very well. Yeah. So this whole business okay. about, you know. So we'll take a 
pause on that, uh, Mr. Free Anchor, and we'll come back with the others. But let's just take a quick break. And there's always a riveting conversation with Elvis Free Anchor uh, for those who know him back from his days as a student leader uh, till now. And we'll be right back after this break. You're welcome back to the key points here on TV3 and 3FM, also on DSTV279 as well as 3news.com. So, Mr. Efriye Anka, so let's come back to um, the other reforms. I yes. know that there are a few others that of, of yes. critical importance to the NDC. That the EC must, by law, be made a mandatory party to all parliamentary election petitions, just as is the case in the presidential election petitions. As we stood today, the EC is not a party to parliamentary petitions. Mm -hmm. And then the EC must be a compelable witness to produce all public elections and related material and documents relevant to presidential and parliamentary election disputes. I mean, we all saw the, what happened in the Supreme Court. Where, and I was there, you know, and it's, it's very sad for Ghana because I recall when we made the application for interrogatories, we made application for examination of documents. All the judges, they said, oh, why don't you wait? When she comes on the witness box, you'll be able to ask those questions. I remember, not once, not, they said it consistently for three days when we were making those applications and they were refusing. Now we get to the time where we wanted her to appear on the witness box. And then they use several procedures to throw that away. So as we sit today, there are many doubts. We knew that there were issues with the elections. But even to the average Ghanaian, there are many doubts about what happened. That would have been an opportunity for her to come and show Ghanaians documentary evidence. This was the basis on which I declared the elections. Okay, so you declared the first election. You saw the result. Where are the documents? Show us. Let's see, what computations did you do? So that everybody will be clear in his mind. But you have a situation where the EC was cocooned by the Supreme Court, in our view, and then she was not able to account for her actions. And it's very serious. Elections have very serious consequences. And so we think that we must have this uh, 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 regulation it's very important so that there will be transparency and other electoral officials will know that when the time comes, because he's a bad president, you know. That it means they won't officer. be held accountable. Exactly. You, you must be held accountable by the highest court of the land. You know, for example, you saw in Techiman where one, uh, the, the returning officer, um, we asked for the coalition, it was live. We asked for the, 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 the spring sheet, the, sheet. The, the summary sheet. He said, I won't give it to you. I mean, what, what impudence. Why should somebody pay by the taxpayer? It's supposed to be a neutral arbiter. And then you have the results, you refuse to give it to us. This thing should not happen. So there should be regulation. And then this one, which is very novel, split the EC into two separate bodies. That has come up, that, that has come up to, with some criticism okay. about creating um, a An power office bureaucracy. Of, uh, regulation of political yes. parties. You see, and want to manage the elections. elections. Because election management is a major, major, major issue. But you do have... we need a separate bureaucracy for that? Don't we just need efficiency? Don't we need the commissioners to ensure that there is efficiency? We believe that if it is separated, it will help the EC to focus on the election. They should focus on the election itself so that you have the EC chairperson um, 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 uh, 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 calling out results and changing them several times. And then the regulation of political parties. For example, we need to be, my, my pet topic, I mean, my biggest passion, if there's anything I want to achieve in my political life before I vacate this earth, funding of political parties. That's the root cause of our problem. One of them, there are many. Of course, uh, this is not the time for the foolishness and misbehavior <laughs> and discipline. <laughs> but, but that is one major, major, major cause. And I am a player. I know what goes on. The amount of money we spend at the end of every four years to elect people into office, if you know, you collapse. It doesn't make sense. You see, we got into this democracy without thinking of where the money will come from. Mm -hmm. The other developed countries, the USA, they have the military industrial complex. They have the Microsoft. They have all these institutions. They, they can generate the money. We got into this democracy without thinking of where the money will come from. Where is the money going to come from? If we spend even 
5% of our GDP on elections is not productive money. It's the same GDP or money that from the system that is used in the election. Can you imagine if that amount of money can be brought down to half or a quarter? Eh? And that, that, that money will be used for productive purposes. So we think that we should be getting to the conversation and talking about funding, state funding of political parties. So that when we the state funds, the corruption. Yeah, when the state funds, then you can regulate. Okay? The countries that are able to regulate are the countries that fund. So we give you money. Don't go beyond this threshold. Don't spend so much. So if you go beyond that, there are stringent sanctions. That is the only way we can solve this problem. Otherwise, that plus greed is a dangerous combination. Because mm. people will go and look for money, borrow money, sell their father's properties and everything, borrow money from banks. They come to power. And then they, they have, have to, to find money to, to pay, pay back. back. And pay back plus greed. So they will steal 10 times. And then apart from the stealing, then they also have to prepare for the next election. And then because now, then the election becomes monetized. And so you are not getting true democracy because people's consciences are bought. Some of the things that happen in this election is completely, I mean, you've seen the Auditor General's reports, COVID money and all that. So if we're going to deal with it, you need an office that will regulate the political parties by the activities, first of all, what uh, so it will, it may even be an advantage for the smaller parties, parties. because to, you to create a threshold their, exactly create a threshold well. look yes you are a small party maybe you are a regional party or you are a party that is focused on environmental issues when the regulations are clear everything will be clear and then we will stop this monetization and killing of uh, uh, ourselves for, okay. for the sake of elections yeah, so, now, so 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 you've put out these reforms and and you know there's been a strong uh, defense put up. You've indicated that the EC says they've they've received it. Yes. Do you have a, a certain timeline within which you're hoping that at least you can see some come to light? We 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 we, we believe that because these are not impositions. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. uh, first of all, the most important is the public discussion mm -hmm. and debates, where there are some that we can easily arrive at consensus, mm -hmm. even among ourselves, in the public. This, is, this can be done, this can be done, this can be done. And mind you, I keep saying that the recommendations are 34, but about um, 10, 12, 12 of them... Are the critical Yes, ones. and then some also are coming from the 2015 committee report. So they are not new, necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's just that they are recommendations that have not yet been implemented. So if you look at it from this context, those things are not entirely new. And there are some that quickly, quickly... Again, a very important point. We think that the voting period of 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. should be maintained. I'm told that you were at IPAC when the suggestion of closing the polls at 3 p.m. was raised. And the NDC supported it because it said it would prevent anything going on under the cover of darkness. What changed your mind? I, don't, I'm, I wasn't under the IPAC. I don't know about the IPAC. Mm. And, and our position has been very consistent. Why? You see, first of all, We've had seven elections, open at seven, close at five. We've never had any problems. So again, back to the American dictum. If it didn't broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. What exactly are you trying to solve? What exactly are you trying to deal with? And they say, oh, we want to prevent uh, collation uh, being done under cover of darkness. Well, when the polls are declared at the police station, it's moved to a collation center. That process takes between five to six hours, minimum, minimum. So inadvertently, you will definitely have to work in the night. Whether you close Whether at, three, you close or at three or not. Whether you close at three or not. So that argument doesn't hold at all. In any case, in other democracies, U.S., everywhere, they work through the night. Mm -hmm. So what we should rather be looking at is, okay, where we're going to do the collation? How is, is it, the environment is like? Is Provide, you know, availability of people to uh, police exactly. the process? Secondly, don't bring soldiers there or people who look like soldiers, but they have beard and earrings to come and shoot innocent people. We'll, we'll talk about that. We have to talk about that because this is the first election in Ghana that eight people have lost their lives. The president hasn't said anything about it, but let me not digress yet. Mm. Then, very, very, very critically, Ghana is not Accra. If you live at the Ridge, you live at uh, East Legon, Kokomlemle, you can just stroll and go to your polling station. Those of us who really know Ghana, in Afram Plains, for instance, people have to cross 
the river. I know the, the Dija Islands. Dija Islands. You have to cross you know, and travel by boat. First of all, the electoral materials doesn't get there early mm -hmm. enough. And then by the time the people cross and come, it's, it's three o'clock. You have a, a pandemonium. And then you have a situation where because electoral materials don't go, we've had situations in previous elections where even voting had to be extended to the next day. Three, our most of our farmers and fishermen, they are people are who like to farmers. go to farm in the morning, in the cool of the day, and then they come and go and vote. Isn't it somebody, just because somebody, the, the, somebody this, said, the election day is not declared some, a public but, holiday? But, but if it's declared a holiday, the average farmer or fisherman doesn't care about holiday. No, if it's not Tuesday that traditionally they won't fish or a day where they are not allowed to go to the farm. It doesn't make any difference to them. The average farmer or fisherman wants to go to that farm early in the morning. And I've, I've been in the village. I've lived in the, the village. I started school in the village. So I know what I'm talking about. Early in the morning, go and get his firewood, get some, the, and come. And then get ready and go and vote. So we are so, not going so to we create should, any So we problem. should stick to the 5 p.m. stick to the 5 7 to 5, 5 p.m. PM. Okay, so and I need you to wrap EC up on this. establish election adjudication committees at the national and constituency levels at administrative dispute resolution mechanisms for first instant grievances against decisions and actions of election officials. Right now, as it stands now, whenever there's a dispute, the only resort is go to court. But some of the issues can be resolved. For example, if you recall Sydney West, where there was an issue about a particular ballot box, and all that needed to be done was to just recount that particular ballot box. It was up and down and down. They had to go to court, and then the court ordered, go and recount. And they went to recount, and that was it. So we, needed, we need an election adjudication committee at the national level. For example, in this election, in my office, with Tony Lita and uh, uh, Marietta and all those people, we wrote a petition to the EC. The petition was sent to the EC. It was during that time. In fact, le let me let people, Ghanaians, know that because of the issues and the complaints that we had, we had met the Peace Council earlier. The Peace Council had arranged that we we're going to have a meeting with the EC to look at the issues. It was based on that that Madame Jemensa told Rojo and co that go and inform your flag bearer that the Peace Council has intervened and therefore there's going to be a meeting to look at all your issues. And they left and then she announced the results. If we had this EAC, our issues would have been looked at. In various constituencies, issues would have been looked at. We look at it if they cannot be resolved before we go to court. But right now, when there's any dispute, the first resort is court and we think that is not proper. Finally, and most importantly, the EC should be required to publish details of all election results on polling station by polling station and constituency I, I, I by constituency. Know, I know that hasn't happened since 2016. Yes. In fact, 20, I think Maybe it's even since 2004. 2012. I recall, if you recall, Rojo Betonunu and the late squadron leader, so they went to, the, court, to court. It's true. And the court did. ruled that. It wasn't necessary. But mm -hmm. I think that with the revolution... Yeah, but I think formally but, since 2016, really, which is when we hoped with these expensive uh, procurements of machines and all that in an effort to make things efficient, we, have, we haven't so had it, that. It, it enhances democracy and transparency. Let's know if there's nothing to hide. Let's everybody know the results are declared at the police station. Put it on your website. Mm -hmm. And so we can all verify. All right. Elvis Sefriye Ankara, Director of Elections for the NDC there. But we are still talking about uh, the NDC. Away from that, you know, the NDC's 2020 flag bearer, John Mahama, had spent the last week or so on a thank you tour primarily focused in the northern sector. He visited uh, uh, the Savannah region, the Upper East, Upper West, Northeast regions, where he talked about many things. He talked about electoral reform. He also talked about some of the issues during the 2020 elections. He talked about development issues, Agenda 111, and also uh, projects that uh, his government initiated, which are yet to be complete. Well, one of the issues he did mention was the creation of new regions regions, which it were, he felt that we should have proper structures in place and that the current administration did not do enough to put those structures in place. Well, the NPP's General Secretary, John Buedu, has been speaking to that issue. Let's hear him. His comments on the creating of the six regions 
is, is, is embarrassing. He accused President Akufuado of creating regions in name, or in name only, without development. He's so wrong on both counts. Facts are that the people in the affected regions, Western, Brown, Ahafo, Volta, and Northern, did petition the then fresh president, Nana Adudankwa Akufuado, after they failed to get the attention and the cooperation of the former president. The mama and his NDC have no shame. After disrespecting and damning the EC and its leadership throughout the electionary campaign, they have the guts to call on the EC to un undertake electoral reforms, even after refusing to attend the opportune platform provided by the EC for all political parties to meet and undertake a review of the conduct of the 2020 elections. The MPP has said that we are not going to dignify their so-called proposals for electoral reforms by responding to them in the media. The media as well as the international community cannot be the right forum for such an exercise. We are a disciplined political party and respect rules. We do not play to the gallery. We are a serious political party and so if the NDC is serious about their demands for electoral reforms, they should table it at the right forum. And uh, that was John Boydou, the General Secretary of the New Patriotic Party. Let me take some of your messages and then I'll come back to Mr. Fria Ankwa, who is still with us in studio. Uh, this one from Aziz Inwa says, the electoral reforms the NDC is proposing are accurate, reliable, functionally and timely because reforms enhance confidence in the election process. Madam uh, Jean Mensa needs to do the needful. This one from Munkaila says, so there is no elderly person in the NDC to do the right thing. How can they propose electoral reforms in the media but not at IPAC? The entire NDC must appreciate the fact that the power is not won on the ground but through serious campaign and well thought out uh, strategy. So instead of the NDC wasting time preparing the minds of their supporters uh, that by all means they are winning elections 2024, they should rather be telling us about their policy alternatives. And a final uh, message uh, from Kwame says, Jifa, please note that in terms of the presidential election, the whole country is one and only one constituency. And that is why since 1992, there has been only one collation center for the presidential elections at the EC headquarters. The 2020 addition of a regional collation center was to introduce 16 centers of inefficiency opaqueness and corruption into our presidential election collation process, resulting in the massive failures we've seen. It's a pity that the NDC did not see through this manipulation far ahead. Thank you very much for your messages. You can send us some more before we wrap up on the program on 055-369-8789. So, Mr. Efriya Ankara, the NDC's uh, 2020 flag bearer has been on a thank you tour. I know that this tour has delayed partly because of the COVID pandemic. And so he did take his time to go around quite a bit and talked about a number of issues. But first, a quick response to uh, Mr. John Buedu's suggestion that the party and, and the flag bearer for 2020 have been disingenuous by seeking to suggest that the creation of these regions uh, were not done based on a certain uh, process and structure. Okay, so first of all, um, it is important that as political leaders, when we speak, we must speak based on facts and do a little bit of research to help. Um, because if you go back to our 2016 manifesto, the NDC's 2016, it was clearly stated that if we had one power, we we're going to split some regions. It was very clear. There's no issue about that. And that is why when the MPP started the process, we give them our wholehearted support. That was the first time that for a major policy like that, you had the two political parties agreeing because it was in our manifesto. So creation of regions, as John Buedu is saying that uh, we did not respond to the people, is not true. It was in our manifesto. And if we had one power, we had that. But the most important point is that the issues that were raised by President Mahama are not issues that are coming out of his own imagination. First of all, when you go to those regions, you will see for yourself, okay? The infrastructure deficit, the infrastructure deficit is very clear. And two, 
when he calls on the chiefs and the people, that is the feedback he gets. And as a responsible leader, a former president and immediate past flag bearer, he has every right to draw the attention of the government. Now look, don't just create regions in names, but provide the needed infrastructure. I think it's a very legitimate call. You know, what I've seen is that the MPP on a daily basis, because of the things they thought they had gotten away with, in 2020, they are becoming very arrogant and disrespectful to Ghanaians. They talk down on everybody. And you see, I keep telling them, we should learn lessons. You're not going to be in power forever. Power is transient. So when the people are saying that look, you've created a region, even administrative offices we don't have. We don't have any infrastructure. Again, you have a situation where we left 123 schools, community day schools. We completed about almost 50. The rest, they are in the bushes, rotten. When we go around... The, the 50 figure you put out is not the figure that is uh, known to us. About, we know that 20, 20 or so were completed. No, the current administration has completed an additional 28 or so, coming to that 50. Mm -hmm. So, no, so I, you didn't know, complete 50 by the time you left about, office. I think it was 40-something. Because I don't or have they the were specific, at various stages of completion. No, no, no. About 40 or so had been completed. And then the rest of the 100 and out of the 123, if you take away the 40, 80 something, were at various stages of completion. When we go around, they, they show us. These are the schools you left behind. Some are 90% complete, 80% complete, 70%, 60, 50, 40% complete. They've been left for rodents. You look at hospitals. Hospitals. You go all over the country, go to say what? A major hospital fashioned after 37 military hospitals, even bigger than that, about 60% complete. The Not government close. has provided explanation mm -hmm. that these hospitals under the Eurojet project mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. uh, suffered um, funding challenges mm -hmm. partly because of COVID, because obviously these monies are coming from abroad. It's only in recent times this year that we've seen some of the projects coming through. Which of the projects? Which of them? The war hospital, we are what, told, is, the, the, is it's only talk. We, we're going to do a comprehensive documentary, and we'll invite you, the media, tell you various projects in education, in health. Look at the uh, Commander Sugar Factory, for instance. But the Commander Let's, Sugar Factory wasn't even as active before you left office. It, but it's been five years. It, I mean, how can it? It wasn't an active. We were on the verge of start. They had started test production. Five years. You've left it to rot. And there should be consequences for this kind of behavior. So, it, President Mahama's tour and the fact that he's bringing up the issues that are germane and of concern to the people is hitting the MPP. And that is why he will come out with such um, unresearched and unscientific. Um, um, dire traps. So I'm sure Ghanaians can judge for themselves. But we, we are speaking facts. And we have not finished the tour. And this is just uh, yes, I was one. just about to ask. So that's just phase one. Oh, that's just phase one. He's so going to go two. everywhere. He's going to go everywhere to every single region. And it's been designed such that because of COVID, he cannot meet large numbers of people. But we use the media effectively. And he's able to speak to the people. And when we go out there and speak to the people, believe me, they are listening to us the few, those who, the interesting thing is that many people, when you go around, everybody is denying that they voted for the MPP. Everybody is denying, oh, we didn't vote for them. Well, some people voted for them. Some people also voted for us. They manipulated the elections. They used violence. But whatever it is. But in terms those of those four figures, more, the, in terms of the... Four more, the four more of one, we have only done eight months. Eh? We have three years and four months to go. So we are all inside. But, four, four more. Okay, so we haven't even done one year. You see how we are suffering. Okay, but, and we all but, day inside. But the so point, they should revise their notes. Okay, but the point is, even for 2024, where there's a view that you political parties only live for elections, the view or the perception out there is that now we've seen both the NPP, we've seen the NDC as well. So for 2024, you both have to work hard 
to earn the votes of Ghanaians. It's not, it's not guaranteed that maybe the of NDC course. will win. It's not of guaranteed course. that the I, MPP I mean, look, will look, be look, re-elected. I, 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 the work I've done since I left university, apart from private, is elections. Mm -hmm. I understand elections very well. How, how do you the see the 2024 elections then? 2024 elections is ours to win. Is it a make or break? Well, it will depend on the structures and institutions that are put in place. Okay, you say it's yours to, to win. To win. Why? We will win the 2024 elections because, you see, if you look at the 2016, 2020 elections, and if you look at the stupendous amounts of money that were pumped into that election, I mean, in some constituencies in the North, for instance, they were spending as much as one million Ghana cities per constituency. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the fact that, and in any case, we won the parliamentary elections, clearly. John Buedu, eh? he said it. I have the video here. I'm not sure about that. Oh, yes, I have it. I'm not sure about I that. I have it. Jifa, you, you can play it. You can. Please forward it to me. Uh, because me I'm not sure he said that. I don't think a general secretary of the ruling oh, he, party he, will say he, that the NDC won. He, the he said won it. It's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's not. It's not, it's I, not I, I think the debate has been uh, considering how close, mm. how near split the election mm. at the parliamentary level was and the concern about, you know, changes, the el changes at the electoral figure. It, it leads to a questioning of the credibility of some of the results or some of the constituencies in contention. Okay. Unfortunately, okay. those issues are still in court. That is fine English. <laughs> uh, it's good. You are a journalist. You can speak your fine English. For us, the elections were stolen. When they realized that they were losing, they deployed thugs wearing military uniforms, some wearing beards with earrings, and they went and shot innocent people, and they stole their votes. Those are the facts. And the president of this republic has not been able to say anything about it. His blood is on his hands, no, and he's building know, but, a cathedral. But, but Mr. He has but, blood on his hands. But Mr. Free Ankara, there are court cases that are ongoing. Yes. If really you felt that the votes were stolen, the view is that even at the Supreme Court, you could not prove that. No, you at could the not Supreme show Court. That it at, was about the presidential. The Supreme, but even we have but those, you could not those show cases that. are in court, yes. number one. Number two, at the Supreme Court, the court did not allow us to ask the questions that needed to be answered. But why because didn't if we you... Ask, if, we, if, we, if we had asked those questions, you declared results. Produce the document. This one too, is it, is it rocket okay, science? But Produce the documentary evidence. I, I, that formed the basis of you declaring results six times. The unprecedented the alternative, in, this, in this country. The alternative view You was cannot that. give us legal strategy because, you see, let me tell you something. We have been to court with the... Uh, MPP before. Mm -hmm. They brought pink sheets. Go and read the, the judgment of the court. Uh, so we're not daft. When you are going to court on a case, you do your research and you look at what the judges say on various issues and then you build your case based on those precedents. So you look at when pink sheets were produced, what was the posture of the Supreme Court? So, you're, so if you are taking pink sheets, not, you, not, you are I'm, saying I'm that not, that would have I'm, gone I'm, against I'm not, the party. I'm, but, I mean, and I'm sorry to say this, but I was in court almost every day from the posture of the court and the fact that consistently on every single issue, there was unanimity. Even if we had taken all the pink sheets in this world and hired Angel Gabriel as witness with Angel Michael, as uh, uh, what uh, technical uh, whatever it is, it would have still been in unanimous. Unfortunately, that that is my view because it, it, it appeared as if they had just made up their minds that they were not going to listen to us. Okay, so that, you said the the 2024 election is yours to win. What's so going to be different? I'm, I'm, is I'm it sending a, to because your, you, yeah. it was deemed that you had a good uh, manifesto for fantastic for manifesto. It wasn't just a good manifesto; it was a fantastic <laughs> manifesto. And uh, so the, the, the texter who said that we should bring our alternatives, we, we've already brought our alternatives. Is that good? So, the, or you look at that manifesto again and of course, decide of if course, it's going of for, course, for we'll 2024. Review it. But you see, there's also a very erroneous uh, perspective out there. And uh, my friends, very, very dynamic, hardworking, fix the country people, some of them tend to make that comment. Oh, NDC and MPP are the same. It's not true. It's not true. The facts do not show. So, 
take sector by sector, education sector, compare the NDC's performance. We built universities, we built polytechnics, we built SHS, okay? As we speak today, the free SHS, which is the flagship program of the MPP, the teachers, now they are saying that the schools will be closed down because the students don't have food. Some of the students have been deborganized. That is the major flagship, that is the major achievement of the MPP government. Though. Okay, so you talk okay. about roads, you talk about health, various roads, sectors, everything. infrastructure. Super. So, so based on that. Evidence to show. Again, we were in this country when Dr. Baumia and Anna Kufado. We are borrowing too much. They, we don't need to borrow. And uh, the money is in this country. I worked on, at Bank of Ghana. All those videos are there. You come into office and you have borrowed. We, are there, we borrow 53 billion. We have things to show. We have universities to show. We have polytechnics to show. We have schools to show. We have hospitals to show. We have roads to show. When they fall sick, they go to the UGMC, University of Ghana Medical Center. They go there. Okay? We have things to show, tangible. You have borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and borrowed. We have we've crossed 300 billion. 300 billion. You alone, you've borrowed about 250 billion. What do you have to show? When you ask them, they say free SHS. The free SHS alone. Free SHS, 1D1F. Where is that? Is which, which, which one, one district what? One planting factor. for food planting and jobs. Planting for which food and jobs? Year of which, 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 uh, and, uh, uh, and what's it? Uh, one village, one dam. Yes. Dugouts. So the, this is, let me, let me, you see, you like so to speak fine, no. fine English. Hey, These Mr. people Freedom are thieves. No, please, we cannot make that accusation here because oh. we don't have any proof of that. Hold on, hold on. We don't on. have any proof hold of on. that, so we hold can't on. call people thieves. Okay. We can't say okay. that. Stealers. We can't say stealers. So which are you know the good English? No, which no. One? we can't call, we can't make allegations against people without uh, listen, okay. a proof. Okay. So, but anyway, wait, wait. we have to wrap no, no, up no, your no, final no, no, comments. No, 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 Corruption, corruption, corruption. Nanado, okay, appointed Martin Amido as a special prosecutor. When he appointed, he said he has confidence in him. He knows that he's incorruptible. He can do very well. Okay? That special prosecutor, after so many, a few years, comes back and said, I was completely deceived. The man I thought was against corruption is actually the mother serpent of corruption. It's interesting that, one, that I didn't use, say it though. Yes, but it's interesting you use uh, 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 Martin Amidu's words like uh, the current their own man. administration, knowing how the NDC ended up in a battle with him. But Yeah, we had battles with him. But Nanado and his MPP said he's a saint. He's super. No, he and they the didn't man, say that. Okay, he's very competent. He's incorruptible. In right? right. But, the man comes out and says the president is the mother serpent. You know what the that is, that is his opinion. But, fee, fee, fee. but anyway, that's Cobra where we have to end. Corruption. It. Thank you very much, Elvis. If we Auditor Anka. General, Always an Auditor General, time you sacked him you. because he was exposing you. And that's where we bring an end to the key points. Um, Elvis, if we Ankara, once he gets into his element, you can't stop. But it's been great having him. Hope he comes again. Thank you all for joining us. My pleasure being with you today. Thank you for spending your Saturday with us. Thanks to the entire production team. Up next is Warm Up Plus. My name is Jifa Bampo.